One dark stormy Halloween night, I had a big fight with my mom. I had told her I was going to a costume party, and she had agreed. Later that day, the sky turned dark and it started getting stormy. I went back to my mother, but to my surprise, she changed her mind. I felt bad, and I still couldn't handle that she still treats me like a baby. I will be 18 in a few months, and my mother still treats me like I'm an eight-year-old. I stormed to my room to text my best friend, Cheryl. I told her not to bother picking me up and that my mom wouldn't let me go to the party. Cheryl was a party freak, so she advised me to sneak out later and texted me the party's address. I thought about it for a while, but ended up agreeing to Cheryl's advice. I knew I had to make my mom stay out my room, so I wore my pink nightgown and pretended to be asleep. My mother came into my room and found me sleeping. She patted me on the head and said some prayers as she wished me a good night. Turned off my room light and shut the door behind her. Immediately, I noticed my mom was out of my room. I sneaked out. On my way to the address, it was a nice and classy restaurant, but it wasn't a party, I thought to myself. There was not many people there. I sat down in front of a couple. A waiter approached to take my order. He was tall and handsome. I smiled as bright as possible and I asked him about the costume party. I showed him the address Cheryl had sent me, and he told me I wasn't at the right address. Your friend must have made a mistake, the waiter said. I asked the waiter for a drink, and I kept calling Cheryl, but all to no avail. Her dial was redirecting me to drop a voicemail. The couple seated in front of me was young. The man was good-looking. He smiled at me and gave me a lustful look, and I looked at him in disgust. He was right there with his wife and still trying to flirt with me. The waiter brought the drink I asked for. There were chocolates and biscuits on the table, so I took some. I remember wondering if they were free. I started feeling funny, so I decided to use the bathroom. I looked around and I saw the bathroom sign. As I walked towards the bathroom, I heard two voices. She's not part of the plan. Then why did you attend her? I told you not to let anyone in. She'll leave anytime soon. No, we can't let her leave yet. She might ruin our plans. I stood there petrified. So many questions were going through my mind. I even forgot to use the bathroom. Right there, I decided to leave the restaurant immediately and call the cops. So I went back to get my bag and leave. But I couldn't find my bag. I asked the couple sitting opposite me, but they didn't respond. Instead, they looked away. I looked up and saw the waiter who served me coming from the bathroom and walking toward me. What's wrong? He asked. I, I can't seem to find my bag, I answered. At this point, my voice trembled and I was shaking. What could be their plan, I thought. The vision of being attacked or raped flashed through my mind. I had kept my phone in my bag before going to the bathroom, but couldn't find my bag. I'll ask security for your bag. Now, sit and take your drink, the waiter told me. His tone was altering. I could sense he was getting annoyed. Immediately, I sat down and smiled. For every second that passed, my eyes were fixed on the door. The waiter noticed this and stood at the door. Right there, my heart was beating fast and I was panicking. The waiter stood still at the door, gazing at me. I wondered if he added something to the drink. I thought about telling the couple in front of me what I heard, but I decided not to. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I was lost in thought. I blamed Cheryl all the while. How could she? I mumbled. The waiter left the door shortly, and another man with firm muscles and broad shoulders came in through the door. He was handsome, but the least I could do was notice him. He winked at the couple. Hello, Jaden. Nice to meet you. The handsome men greeted each other. The front door was still open, so I stood up and was ready to leave when I heard the waiter's loud voice. I sat back down and pretended to eat. Can I eat with you? Jaden, the man who had just entered, asked. Suit yourself, I replied. He tried starting a conversation, but I wasn't giving in. He called the waiter and asked for a drink, which he went away to get. My eyes followed the waiter around, and then I saw a back door. I stood up quietly and walked casually to the back door. I opened the door and saw someone outside. I strode past him, and then I started walking faster. Hey, stop! Someone shouted. It was Jaden. 
I didn't listen. Instead, I ran, and he started running after me. I was shouting for help, but there was so much noise, no one could hear me. I was already in tears, and my vision was getting blurry. I tripped and fell. I looked back, and he was already close to me. I quickly stood up to run, but he was fast. I thought about what my mom had said. I should have listened to her. I should have stayed at home. Jaden caught me and held my hand tightly. As he dragged me, I peed myself uncontrollably. I kept begging and crying. Please don't hurt me. I'll give you whatever you want. A strange man attacked Jaden and hit him with a rod on the head and he fell to the ground. I tried to run again. No one is going to hurt you. Just follow me. The man who rescued me said as he pinned Jaden to the ground and handcuffed him. He told me to calm down and showed me his ID. He told me he was an undercover agent and that a criminal was still in the restaurant and they were trying to arrest him. He told me to clean my tears and go back inside the restaurant. I was confused, but I decided to play along. I went back and sat down. The man in front of me looked shocked when he saw me and not Jaden. He stood up to leave with his wife. Two men entered and walked to where I was. My heart was about to pop out when I heard, You're under arrest, Anderson. Your game stops here. It turns out, the couple sitting in front of me wasn't a real couple. The man was a serial killer, and Jaden was his accomplice. He abducts young girls, drugs, torture, and kills them. He had been wanted for years. The lady I thought was his wife was a new victim. He had given her some injections and she wasn't in her right senses. I couldn't believe I thought someone as evil to be good looking. The police had gotten information that he was coming to that restaurant for dinner. Everyone in the restaurant was an undercover agent except me. I watched the police capture Anderson. As he tried to escape, something fell from his body and to my surprise it was my bag the lady was wheeled away in an ambulance and anderson was handcuffed and taken to the police station the waiter who attended to me introduced himself as detective mike he handed my bag to me and told me if anderson hadn't been caught i could have been his next victim the police dropped me home that night the siren had woken my mom and she was already waiting outside but before she could say anything I hugged her in tears. I'm sorry, mom, I said repeatedly. I couldn't sleep that night, and I still get PTSD whenever I'm around the subway, knowing fully well that I could have been a killer's next victim. It started when I was 14 years old. I had gone to bed the night before in my home, but when I woke up, I realized that I was lying on a bench in our town's park. Now, I loved going to the park when I was a kid, as my dad used to take me there before he passed. It was a place I always felt safe, but that morning, I was extremely confused as to how I got there and why I was still wearing my PJs. My mind couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation for it, so I made my way home. When I finally arrived, I saw the worried looks on my mom's and her then-boyfriend Thomas Wyatt faces. As they rushed to hug me, my mom told me that she was extremely worried when she couldn't find me in my room that morning, and she was just about to call the cops as they really thought I was missing. Confused and upset, my mom asked why I left the house late at night. But I was just as confused as her, and I told her I didn't remember leaving the house. The confusion just rose from there, till our neighbor, Old Lady Margaret, told my mom and me that she caught a glimpse of me sleepwalking very late last night. I never had a problem with sleepwalking before, so my mom took me to see a doctor. The doctor told my mom that the sleepwalking could have been caused by numerous things, but she assured my mom that it was a common phase in a growing child's life, and I would eventually grow out of it. My mom felt calmer after hearing that, and she assumed that it was going to be a one-night thing, but unfortunately for her, that was just the beginning. As I started to constantly sleepwalk every single night after that day, just like the first night, every time I sleepwalked, I would always wake up at the park. Most nights, my mom stayed up and made numerous attempts to wake me, but I was told I would scream anytime someone tried to. Most of the time, it felt like they were telling me stories about another person, 
as I absolutely couldn't recall doing the things they said I did. After a while, I could tell my sleepwalking problem was getting worse as it showed no signs of stopping. Apparently, during the previous night, my mom's boyfriend, Thomas, had managed to carry me back to my room when I sleepwalked out of the house, but I didn't stay there for long, as I was told I left my room a few minutes later. That's when they realized that even putting me back in my room didn't stop the sleepwalking. Thomas had been really supportive of me and my mom during the sleepwalking phase. He was a really nice guy, and he was the only one of my mom's numerous boyfriends who made an effort to get to know me as he always tried his best to get close to me. Through all this, he gave me and my mom reassuring words, and he was always there to lend a helping hand. But even with the help of both Thomas and my mom, the sleepwalking didn't stop. They eventually tried to lock my room's door, but I was told I would scream till it was open. More visits to the doctor were made, and the doctor told my mom that locking me in my room wouldn't solve anything, as making me feel trapped will just make things worse. As this went on, it didn't take long before I noticed my mom was really worried, so that night I decided to do something about it. I decided to pull an all-nighter, as I believed that if I stayed awake all night, I would be able to overcome the recurring sleepwalking. Things went fine at first, as I managed to stay awake for most of the night. But once the clock struck 12.30, I felt intense fear, as each and every hair on my body began to stand. I didn't know why I suddenly got scared, as there was nothing in my room. But the crippling fear just rose from there. I tried my best to fight it, but my body wanted to leave my room, and the only word that was screaming through my mind was run. Words can't really explain how I felt that night, as I wondered what I was supposed to be scared of in my own home. It was nearing 1 o'clock a.m. now, and the overwhelming fear really started to get to me. I eventually couldn't take it anymore, as my body told me that I needed to run now. So I agreed. I made my way to the door, and as I opened it, I saw my mom's boyfriend, Thomas, standing in front of the door. Then I ran into his arms as I said, I'm so glad you're here, Thomas. I'm really scared, and I don't know why. I'm also really confused, and all I know is that my gut told me I needed to get out of my room now. When I was done talking, I looked at Thomas, who now had a sick grin on his face. He then looked at me and said, Now, my sweet Clara, I need you to be a good girl and behave nicely for me. I promise I'll have my fun and you won't remember a thing when I'm done. I'm so happy that you're in your room tonight, my sweet Claire. After our first wonderful night together, I wanted to spend all my nights with you. But you started sleepwalking and I could never find you in your room. I even tried to put you back in your room on most nights, but you always left again. Thankfully, you finally overcome that problematic issue tonight and you've come running right back into my arms. Appalled, I stepped back from him as I had a horrific realization. At first, I thought it was just a bad dream, but everything from that night started coming back to me. I remembered how he came into my room and pressed a white cloth over my nose. I remembered how powerless I was to do anything as the chemical he used to drug me was potent. I then finally realized why I was so terrified as it happened at exactly 1 a.m. on that fateful night. I recalled how I didn't tell my mom about it because the chemical I was drugged with made me forget most of what happened and it also made me feel like it was just a bad dream. Terrified, I looked at Thomas who was now bringing out the same white cloth from his pocket he then walked up to me as he said, Now, my sweet Clara, I need you to be a good girl and behave nicely for me. I promise I'll have my fun and you won't remember a thing when I'm done. I tried to run out of the room, but he grabbed me before I could reach the door. He tried to force the cloth over my nose, but I struggled and resisted. I started to fight back, and I managed to bite his hand really hard. He screamed from the pain as he threw me across the room. My whole body ached now, but I wasn't going to give up. I started to scream out my mom's name as I crawled toward the door. My mom, who had become a light sleeper ever since I started to sleepwalk, rushed into the room. It didn't take long before she realized what was going on, 
and she started to protect me by fending off his repeated attacks. He was far stronger than her, and it didn't take long before my mother was being beaten by the man who she thought loved her. I knew my mom gave me a chance, and I wasn't going to waste it, so I ran. I ran all the way out of the house to see old lady Margaret standing on our lawn with a phone in her hand. She said she had heard screaming, so she decided to call the cops, and it didn't take long before I started to hear the sirens. After that traumatizing experience, Thomas Wyatt was arrested and given up to 30 years in prison. I had to see numerous psychologists after that experience, and with the knowledge of the incident, they told my mom and me that the cause of the sleepwalking was my body subconsciously trying to protect itself while I slept by automatically undergoing the fight or flight response seen in humans when danger is near. She then added that the body takes itself to somewhere it feels safe, which is why I kept waking up at the park. The psychologist then told me and my mom that sleepwalking cases like these were very rare. After the incident, my mom constantly blamed herself for bringing that man into our house. I always told her it wasn't her fault and that I didn't blame her for anything that happened that night. For a period after that, even though I was 15 years old, I found myself sleeping in the same bed as my mom, just like I used to when I was a kid. I always felt safe whenever I did that, and after those nights, I never went sleepwalking again. All my life, I have never been one to believe in ghosts. I was a man of science and always believed that there was a coherent explanation for everything. But there was a time in my life when I started to doubt those beliefs as something really strange started to happen in my apartment. I first noticed it after I had gone grocery shopping. I'd bought enough food and snacks to stock the fridge and little pantry that I had in my apartment. I remember eating well that night and saving some leftovers for the next day. I went to bed and after some time when I woke up the next morning, I decided to warm up last night's leftovers for breakfast. But when I opened my fridge, I couldn't find them. Shocked, I wondered what could have happened to the leftovers that I left the night before. At first I thought I had kept them somewhere else and forgotten about it, so I looked around a little bit more in the fridge. But no matter how much I looked, they had completely disappeared. As I kept searching through my fridge, I realized something that was very odd. The leftovers weren't the only thing that were missing, as a substantial amount of other food items were gone too. I was completely baffled now, so I looked into my little pantry to see if any food items there were missing too, and as I opened it, I realized that my pantry had also been ransacked. My mind was struggling to come up with a substantial explanation as to why my food was disappearing, and my first feasible thought was that it had to be rats. I quickly realized how stupid that was, as even I knew that rats weren't capable of opening fridges and pantries, and even if they could, there would obviously be traces of crumbs or something. The strange phenomenon left me speechless for a while as I kept racking my brain. I knew I was home alone all through yesterday, so no one else could have taken the food items. It took me a while, but I eventually snapped out of it and went on with my day. I remember telling one of my friends about it and he made a joke saying, Maybe it's a starving poltergeist. I mean, I've always told you that ghosts were real and maybe this one is a chubby ghost who just wants to steal your food. I didn't laugh at this joke, so he continued with, Chill out, dude. Maybe it's just your mind playing tricks on you or maybe you're just becoming forgetful, but you'll find those missing food items. Trust me. My friend's words put my mind at ease and I eventually decided to shrug it off and forget about the whole thing. When I got home that night, I saw my girlfriend was waiting for me in my apartment. She was sitting on the couch watching a movie and that's when I remembered that I had given her a key. I immediately wanted to ask if she was the one taking my food, but I stopped myself. We hadn't been going out long, but I didn't think she was a thief, so I decided to let it slide. We both slept at my apartment that night, and the next morning when I opened the fridge, the food was significantly smaller than what I had left there last night. I decided to ignore this as I told myself that it couldn't have been her. I was completely sure that she was with me all through the night so there was no way it could have been her. But as the week passed by, more and more food items were going missing and it reached a point where I couldn't take it anymore. So I confronted my girlfriend. I remember telling her, I know this is a weird question, but 
I need you to tell me the truth. Are you the person who's been taking my food from my apartment? Shocked, she looked at me and said, What the heck are you talking about? What do you mean taking food from your apartment? I then looked her dead in the eyes as I said, Well, for the past week now, a lot of food items have been going missing from my fridge, and I'm 100% sure that I'm not the one taking it. Plus, you're the only person who has a key to my apartment, in addition to free access to my fridge. I could tell she was angry now as she looked at me and said, What's that supposed to mean? Are you accusing me of stealing food from you? Because if you are, you've completely lost your mind. I don't need you to feed me. Things just escalated from there and it didn't take long before we got into a very heated argument. I eventually left the apartment before things got any worse as I wanted to clear my head. I walked around for a while before getting an incredible idea. On my way back home, I stopped at a store and bought a little security camera. When I got back home, I set the camera in a position that directly pointed at the fridge and my pantry. While my girlfriend had vehemently denied ever stealing from me, I didn't fully believe her as I knew not to blindly trust the words that came out of her mouth. I convinced myself that she had been sneaking into my apartment when I was home alone to take the food items, so I decided to personally catch her red-handed by using the camera to film her and get her stealing from me on tape. There was no way she was going to be able to deny it if I showed her the irrefutable footage, so I made sure she didn't see me setting up the camera. After a while, I eventually started feeling sleepy, but I was a bit thirsty too, so I decided to get a cup of water from the fridge. When I was done, I went to bed and I finally felt myself dozing off. I didn't know when I finally slept off, but when I woke up the next morning, the first thing I did was to check my fridge. Surely enough, numerous items had gone missing, so I rushed to check the camera's footage. I had a smile on my face as I couldn't wait to confront my girlfriend with the hard proof that I had acquired. But as I kept watching the footage, my confidence turned to terror as I saw an unknown woman climbing out of the small storage space in my ceiling. I tried, but I couldn't make out her face as her hair covered most of it. Horrified, I watched as she started to roam my fridge and pantry. As the footage kept playing, I felt a crippling fear fill each and every inch of my body as I watched how she ran to hide when I came out for a glass of water. Numerous horrific scenarios played out in my head as I realized that this woman could have killed me last night. The video was now nearing its end as I watched the woman go back into the small storage space that she crawled out of. This meant that she was probably still in my apartment. When the footage was finally done, it took a lot of strength, but I tried to keep myself from screaming. I knew I couldn't apprehend the strange woman on my own, so I calmly called the cops. When the cops arrived, I quickly showed them the footage and the woman was immediately taken out of the storage space and arrested. The cops believed that she had been living there for a while now, and they told me I was lucky to have found her as it was only a matter of time before the strange woman did something really morbid. I was scared shitless after that incident, and I remember asking my friend if I could stay at his place for a couple of days as I didn't want to stay in my apartment for some time. It's been a while since this happened, and numerous security measures have been put in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. I still check the storage space from time to time as the paranoia really gets to me sometimes. I also started to live by a very famous quote as nowadays I pretty much sleep with one eye open. October 12th, 2012 is a day that's etched into the walls of my very unstable mind. The day began like every other, but by 6.15 p.m., we came to know the first of the many horrors that the coming week had in store for us. I can still hear her gut-wrenching screams every time I close my eyes. It's like the sounds are soldered into my soul, as no matter how many liters of alcohol I dump down my throat, I can still distinctively hear her screams ringing in my ears. It's taken a long time, but I've eventually come to live with it as I know that I deserve every minute of this eternal torture that is now my life. The only thing I can do now is look back on that day and regret my actions, as with only three words, I single-handedly set off a chain of events that would eventually lead to both the beginning of a dreadful time and the end of my career at the SCP Foundation. To fully understand my story, I would need to take you two weeks back into the month of September. 
before that dreadful day had ever begun. The day was the 25th of September, 2012. And looking back on it now, I'm pretty sure that was one of the best days of my life. I joined the SCP Foundation in the year 2009, and in just four years, I managed to rise to the top. I was a brilliant scientist, and I carried out numerous successful operations and investigations. I also ushered in new, better, and more efficient methods to use during numerous operations. And with one successful case after another, it didn't take long for the higher-ups to promote me to an A-class personnel. At the time, the buzz around my name was huge, as there was already rumors going around about me meeting one of the Zero Five Council members. Apparently, he or she had taken notice of my achievements, and they were also really impressed with my work. So they had recently decided to meet me in person, as I heard a day was supposedly being set. I remember being on cloud nine that day, as I let all the attention go to my head. The praise and attention I was getting wasn't the only thing going on that week, as we had recently been receiving reports, records of an anomalous object located on the outskirts of Karpova, a small village in Russia. Due to my recent amazing track record, I was quickly given the case by the higher-ups, so I immediately mobilized the mobile task forces, MTF Epsilon 6 to be exact, as they were going to go to Karpova, report back any sightings or effects of the anomaly, and finally secure and retrieve the object. Within hours, reports from the site were already being sent back to me to analyze, and as I got to work, I couldn't help but notice something really strange. For starters, the report stated that the small village was now deserted as our field agents didn't see any living person there. Apparently, most of the people in the settlement had fled and the remaining 56 people who were hurriedly left behind were all dead. Now, this wasn't what was strange to me, as anomalous objects usually left trails of dead bodies behind. No, that was pretty normal. What was strange was the way, or should I say, the manner in which these people died. The field agents' live reports, in addition to numerous videos and images, show that each of these victims died in a morbidly different way. For starters, the charred corpse of a nine-year-old girl was found in an abandoned burnt building. Another victim's bloated blue corpse was found by the side of a river. From what we could tell, he was a 36-year-old fisherman who had drowned. The third victim was found on the floor of her home. She had a huge bloody gash on her head, and all evidence made it clear that she bled to death. And as I kept going through all the reports, one by one, I realized that none of the 56 people died in the same way. I was confused, as most anomalous objects usually operate by a certain pattern, so this was a bit peculiar to me. By the time our field agents were done cleaning up the scene, the next thing was to identify and retrieve the anomalous object. A perimeter was formed around the village as it was being searched, and some field agents were sent out to the neighboring settlements to find and ask the people who fled some questions. It was pretty hard to pinpoint exactly what the object was, but after finding some residents of the village and asking them questions, we realized that the villagers who fled all feared a certain object, an object they called Igrok Diavola, Igrok Diavola, a sentence that translated into the devil's player. After that conversation, and in addition to all the information we had received, we managed to retrieve the object in the basement of an abandoned building. The building was dated all the way back to the 1700s, and it was believed by the locals to be owned by an old cult that was once rampant around the area. Once the object was retrieved, contained, and secured, I immediately ordered for it to be sent to Site 300-14, Krasnoyarskrai, Russia, which was both the closest and our only site in Russia. Before the object arrived, I managed to gather my team there for us to study and analyze the new anomaly. These people were the smartest people I knew, and I didn't do any case without them. I really needed them all to carry out a clean case, especially my right-hand woman, Amelia Scott. She wasn't just one of my best scientists. She was also one of my closest and oldest friends at the Foundation. We'd known each other since the beginning, and we both had worked our way up together. By the time she and the rest of my team arrived, we decided to take out a little time to exchange pleasantries and catch up before getting back to the task at hand. It took about 30 minutes for the object to arrive on site, and it didn't take long before we started our analysis and observation of the anomaly. And after the first hour had passed, these were my first impressions. For starters, the object was an old-timey phonograph machine. It looked pretty normal, 
as it basically had the appearance of every old version of the phonograph device, but that's where its normality stopped. You see, historical records show that the first phonograph was invented in the year 1877 by the brilliant scientist Thomas Edison. And while several improvements were made by Alexander Graham Bell in the following years, in addition to Emily Berliner's further improvements and rebranding of the machine to the term gramophone, it is still historically proven that the story of the machine began in the year 1877. But when our scientists carried out the radiocarbon dating, a test used by scientists to determine the age of an object, the results of the test baffled us all, as it was revealed that the object's origin dated back to the 1500s, which was 300 years before the device was even conceived. Shocked at the impossible age of the device, we carried out the test again, and the answer remained the same. Now that we knew the absurd date was accurate, we decided to carry out numerous in-depth examinations of the device to further learn its mysteries. The device was made out of fine wood. We assumed it was mahogany, but we couldn't tell. The craftsmanship was spectacular, as it was well made, but the strange thing that stood out on the device was its disc. For starters, the color of the disc was a very distinctive hue, something I had never seen before. And when we analyzed the disc, we realized that the material bore no similarities to any element on Earth, as we had no idea what the disc was made of. We tried to remove the disc from the device, but all efforts made to remove it was impossible, as it seemed that the strange disc was either held tight by glue or soldered onto the machine. After thorough investigations were made on the device, we waited and watched for 14 hours to see its abnormal behavior or its anomalous characteristics, but nothing happened. We waited for two days straight before the object finally showed its strange characteristics. I think it was about noon when we noticed that the machine had started to wound itself. The hand crank, situated on the side of the machine, moved on its own for approximately three to six minutes before it stopped. After it was done, a few minutes of silence followed before what seemed like static noise started to shoot out of the sound horn. We all had perplexed looks on our faces as it sounded exactly like the static noise made by a radio or television set and it was extremely strange hearing the sound coming from a phonograph device. The static noise went on for a few minutes before it abruptly stopped. A quick silence then filled the room for a few seconds before we began to hear a voice come out of the sound horn. The voice was definitely human, as it sounded like it belonged to an old news reporter. At first, the sound and audibility of the voice were low, but eventually, the message began to get clearer and clearer as we heard the words. Day, October 12th, 2012. Time of death, 6.15 p.m. Report. The victim was found morbidly impaled to the wall by metallic and glass shards. Efforts were made to rescue the victim, but it was all to no avail. Name. The victim was known as Static Noises. And then it stopped. Silence filled the room as we all pondered what we had just heard. The day was the 28th of September, 2012. So we all wondered why the machine was reporting an incident concerning a day that hadn't happened yet. We decided to carry out more studies and observations on the device during the following week, but nothing else happened. In the past, I had normally dealt with anomalous objects that were constantly exhibiting strange characteristics. So seeing this one exhibiting one strange characteristic before going dormant was extremely odd. After more studies, I came to the conclusion that while it was an anomalous object, it wasn't the one causing the deaths, as I truly believed that there was a secondary part to this anomalous object. A part we didn't retrieve. And while putting together all our extensive research in addition to the object's behavior, I also came to the conclusion that the object, which was now identified as SCP-6690, was an auditory and musical anomaly. So I sent back another task force to Karpova, MTF ETA-11, they were the special task force who dealt with similar cases like this one, and I instructed them to check if there was any secondary part of SCP-6690, but all reports came back with nothing. Even though the reports that came back said there was nothing there, I was sure that my hypothesis was correct, so I ordered them to keep looking till they found something. As I kept on spreading my thoughts and sticking to my theory, I realized that not everyone was on the same page as me. Amelia and my other scientists weren't convinced that there was a secondary part of SCP-6690. She believed that we should wait till the date announced by SCP-6690 to see if anything happened before we made any conclusions. But I really didn't want to wait 
as I had received news that morning that the date had finally been set for me to meet the member of 05 Council. It was scheduled to be on the 13th of October at Site 73 in Texas, USA. I knew I had to travel to the U.S. on the 11th, which meant that I couldn't stay back in Russia to examine it. A lot of thoughts flew through my head at that moment, as I knew she was right. But I also knew what meeting a member of the 05 Council meant for my career. As I was certain, that meeting alone would skyrocket my career to greater heights, so I let my ego get the best of me, as I muttered the three words that would mark the beginning of a very dark time in my life. It's probably safe. Amelia didn't look too sold on my statement, so I tried to convince her by saying, Come on, Amelia. Have I ever been wrong about these things? She was still a bit uneasy, but she had been by my side all through my past triumphs. So I knew she trusted my word. It took a while, but she eventually agreed. I was ecstatic that we were finally on the same page, as I didn't like the division in our circle. And to further put our mind at peace, I said, But if you're still uneasy or unsure, we can take it with us to Site 73 for further analysis. That statement finally settled everything as we immediately started making preparations to leave. We landed in the United States on the 11th of October, 2012. I had already labeled SCP-6690 as a safe class object because being a study facility, only safe classes were allowed on Site 73. The 12th of October came pretty quickly, and once the clock hit 12 a.m., we all watched and observed SCP-6690 for 18 hours straight, expecting it to do something, but absolutely nothing happened. It was 6 p.m. when I finally decided to start wrapping things up. I assumed that if nothing had happened this long, then nothing could possibly happen again. My theory was beginning to look more and more feasible as they all began to agree with my hypothesis. So I told them to ignore the 616 stated time as I assured them again that if nothing happened in 18 hours, nothing was surely going to happen in the next 16 minutes. We were all tired, so everyone agreed as we packed up our equipment and began to leave. The sun started to set outside when I looked at Amelia and said, I don't want to be that guy, but I told you so. We both laughed before she responded with, Well, I can't argue with that. You were right and I admit it. Although, this does mean that your hypothesis on there being a secondary part of SCP-6690 was absolutely correct. I shouldn't have doubted you. I smiled at her before saying, Don't worry, you were just being safe and a little bit paranoid, but I was 100% sure when I told you that SCP-6690 was safe. Look, it isn't the first anomaly to work in tandem with another. Maybe we missed something, or maybe there's a totally different anomaly that we didn't get back in Karkova. But just give it some time and we'll eventually find it. She then nodded her head in affirmation as she said, Yeah, you're right. You always are. Well, it's been a long day, but I still have to file the report. So let me do that, and then we can explore your big meeting tomorrow. You may not know it, but you're literally the Foundation's new superstar. We both laughed at our joke, and I smiled at her before she finally left the room. Fifteen minutes. Just fifteen minutes had passed. We had gotten out some champagne as we were finally about to celebrate another victory. And out of nowhere, a huge explosion was heard. Blood-curling screams were heard all through the building as we tried to pinpoint the origin of the explosion. And with no hesitation, I ran as fast as I could, knowing Amelia was there. I prayed for her to be safe, but when I finally reached my destination, the scene displayed before me made my heart drop into my stomach. Impaled on the wall was my friend Amelia, as a 15-inch metal shard was embedded in her abdomen. I also noticed that numerous glass shards were sticking out of her face and her right eye. The scene was ghastly, but I snapped myself out of it as I immediately rushed to get her down. But when I finally reached her, I hesitated as I knew pulling out that shard would mean her instant death. Her screams began to die down as she had lost a lot of blood. I walked closer to her, and as I looked into her eyes, I could see the unimaginable pain she was going through as she struggled to speak. The Foundation's paramedics began to rush into the room, but within seconds, before they could do anything, she was already dead. Paralyzed with fear, I slowly looked at the clock on the wall, and to my absolute horror, it was 6.16 p.m. on the dot. The news of a dangerous SCP on site spread like wildfire, as Site 73 was put under lockdown. The 05 council member who had arrived a few hours earlier 
quickly canceled our meeting and was immediately escorted off the premises. Within minutes, my career was over, as it was revealed that I was the one who brought the supposed safe class object onto the premises. I was immediately given instructions by the higher-ups to finish my research of the object on site as it was too unpredictable to transport. And when I was done, I was told to report in for the future of my career at the Foundation. It took about three weeks to wrap up the analysis of SCP-6690. And those three weeks became a literal living hell for all the people who worked at Site-73. No one was allowed to leave the site as it was revealed that SCP-6690 had a wide reach regardless of where it was kept. So the higher-ups believed that we were already infected by whatever it was that SCP-6690 did to people. For the first time in the history of the SCP Foundation, class didn't matter as we all automatically became Class D personnel overnight. We lost over 70 people in the span of three weeks as SCP-6690's messages were now heard multiple times a week and in some cases, multiple times a day. Just like in the case of Amelia Scott, one random person died at the exact same time and in the exact same manner reported by SCP-6690's messages. Tom Miller, who was one of my friends and a Class A personnel, was found dead with his head in his food on October 14th at 1.02 p.m. An autopsy revealed that his heart had ruptured in his chest. Clara Smith, a member of the research department, was also found dead on October 18th at 9 a.m. Shockingly, she was electrocuted by a safe socket that didn't bring out more than the standard 120 volts. Even when people didn't do anything dangerous, as many people decided that if they didn't move or if they hid somewhere safe, they wouldn't get killed. But unfortunately, their theory didn't work as Frank Jackson, a Class B scientist who hid in the storage room, was found dead on the floor on October 20th, 2012, 3.19 p.m. His skull was smashed by a storage unit that had fallen on his head while he was sleeping. As the days went by, I eventually started wishing I would be the next one to die. But day after day, I was spared. We eventually started getting reports from outside Site 73, as the neighboring towns had started to report numerous strange deaths to the authorities. We managed to pinpoint the exact radius and reach of SCP-6690, as we found out that its effects were felt over 155 square miles, 401,448,157 square meters, meaning that, given enough time, it had the power to potentially kill thousands of people living in a small town. During the research, we also realized that SCP-6690 had the power to bend, alter, and manipulate matter itself. Because when we reviewed the death of Amelia Scott, we found out that the explosion was caused by a 9.5% concentration of methane gas in the air, particularly in the area behind a cabinet made of metal and glass. As a scientist, this was an extremely disturbing realization, as methane isn't part of the gases that make up the air around us, and it certainly doesn't appear randomly. Similar findings were also discovered when we reviewed the death of Tom Miller, as it was revealed that his blood pressure was increased to an extremely dangerous level. A level so high that it caused his heart to pretty much rupture and explode. More and more disturbing things were found out about SCP-6690, but by the end of the third week, we had started reaching a conclusion. By the time the analysis and our research were over, SCP-6690 was transported to a secure and undisclosed location. It was taken to a place very far away, but the place was still under the Foundation's reach as I heard that the site was located about 10,000 miles in the frozen desert from Area 314, Akalawid, Nunavut, Canada. It was particularly chosen for its isolated condition and lack of human life. It was transported there by MTF Lambda 5, as SCP-6690 was now considered a reality-bending anomaly. Its class was bumped up to Euclid, and even though some of the Foundation scientists argued that it should be kept under Keter class, it wasn't put there because I told them that while it was a bit difficult, SCP-6690 could be easily contained under the right circumstances. When the case was done, I was relieved of my position at the SCP Foundation. I was told by some of the higher-ups that they were thinking of something more severe as a punishment, and the only reason why I was let off easy was due to the great contributions I had given to the Foundation in the past. It's been over 10 years now, and I'm still reeling from the incident. 
I've contemplated committing suicide many times over the past few years, but I don't even have the balls to do that because I know deep down that wherever I go, when I die, I can never look my friend Amelia Scott in the eyes. So I spend my days drinking myself into a stupor and counting down the days in this living nightmare that I used to call my life. SCP-6690, also known as The Devil's Player, or the voice of the Grim by survivors of Site 73's massacre. Class Euclid bears the appearance of an old phonograph machine. Model unknown. It is currently located in an undisclosed and isolated location about 10,000 miles from Area 314, Akalawood, Nunavut, Canada. Reports state that it's being kept in a soundproof safe with dimensions measuring 152 by 91 by 143 centimeters. This was done because it is believed to dampen its reach and as a precaution in case any civilian comes within its range. SCP-6690 Anomalous Properties states that it has the ability to alter, bend, and manipulate matter in order to cause the deaths of people within its range. Strange messages or recordings are heard coming out from its sound horn, and with that, it details the day, time, and manner in which the victim will die, without revealing the individual's name. Reports also state that nothing can be done to stop the process once it has begun. Formerly thought to be a safe class object, SCP-6690 took the lives of over 70 personnel during the Site-73 massacre. The costly mistake of the object being wrongly classed was the fault of the then-famed SCP scientist James Carter. He was relieved from his position and his current whereabouts are still unknown. To anyone listening to this, every word of the experience you're about to hear is true. Due to security and privacy reasons, I won't be disclosing my real name, so I'll identify as Sean in this story. For most of my life, I've suffered from a particular form of crippling fear, and this morbid experience will tell you why. The word masculophobia is not used very often when diagnosing the cause of fear in adults. For those of you who don't know what this means, masculophobia is the irrational fear of people in costume clothing like masks or mascots. Now, this phobia is normally seen in toddlers and young children as their minds are too small to understand the concepts of mascots. Naturally, with age, almost every child grows out of the phobia as their minds develop. That's why this phobia is rarely seen in adults, as our brains and bodies are fully developed to understand what mascots are. Now, after explaining all of this, what I'm about to tell you will seem very strange because at 62 years of age, I still suffer terribly from this fear. To make things a bit clearer, I have a pretty peculiar form of masculophobia as I'm not actually scared of every single person in a costume or mascot. No, to be honest, I'm only scared of a particular one. To understand why I have this phobia, I will have to take you back to the year 1983. I had just gotten a job working at a nearby Domino's Pizza restaurant. Now in the late 1990s, numerous chain restaurants were popping up everywhere and in order to stand out and gain popularity for their products, numerous advertising methods were used. Out of all these methods, the most popular and effective ones were the creation of mascots. Nowadays, these iconic mascots have become synonyms with these restaurants, as I'm sure everyone knows these names. Ronald McDonald became the face of the McDonald's restaurant in the year 1963. Wendy Thomas became the face of the Wendy's restaurant in the year 1967. And Chuck E. Cheese became the face of the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant in the year 1977. The trend of mascots just went up from there, as every massive restaurant chain in the fast food industry really wanted to boost the popularity of their products. Now, in the year 1986, Domino's Pizza, which was already a massive fast food chain at the time, wanted to hop on the mascot trend. Those of you who were born in the late 1990s or early 2000s may not remember this, as in recent times, the Domino's Pizza restaurant has no notable mascot. But believe it or not, we used to have one, and it was called The Noid. 
The Noid was created in the year 1986 for Domino's by Will Vinton's Studios. The character looked like what seemed to be a humanoid rabbit, dressed in a red onesie and had a black N on its chest. I had already spent three years working for Domino's in a Shambly, Georgia branch before the character was introduced. I recall seeing the character everywhere as it became pretty popular. Numerous advertisements were made for the character and the catchphrase, avoid the Noid, was coined. This was because, at the time, Domino's promised a 30-minute delivery guarantee, and in the televised ads, the character was known for trying to interfere with or delay the pizza delivery. Throughout the next three years, the character gained more popularity as toys, merchandise, and video games were created. As a Domino's employee, I remember being constantly surrounded by this new character called The Noid, and it didn't take long before I eventually grew fond of it as I bought and collected any toys or video games that I could get my hands on. The affinity I had for this character just grew from there, as I was always waiting for new Noid-related items to drop. But all that love came to an abrupt end on the 30th of January, 1989. That Monday morning started out like the rest of my mornings. I wasn't actually supposed to work that day, but one of my fellow employees called in sick, so I had to fill in for him. I got there by 9 a.m., and I was greeted by my co-worker. I will not be able to give out her real name, so she will be identified as Katie in this story. After exchanging pleasantries, we immediately got to work, and it wasn't until 11 a.m. that our morning took a drastic turn. A strange man had just walked into the restaurant, and I remember opening my mouth to greet him before I saw him point a gun at my face. I had seen scenes like this in the movies numerous times but nothing could have prepared me for that moment. No words can explain how I felt when I found myself staring down the gun's barrel. The armed man then slowly looked at me and Katie as he said, If you don't want to know what the inside of your heads look like, I suggest you walk towards me with your hands where I can see them. You're both going to be my hostages. Me and Katie didn't say a word as we did exactly what he asked us to do. Our attacker then grabbed us as he said, Don't look at me like that. You're all his accomplices. Him and everyone here. You've all ruined my life. Katie, who was far braver than me, managed to stutter the words. Please, sir. You've got the wrong people. We don't know who you're talking about. Enraged, the man then screamed, Don't lie to me. You all know Tom Monahan. Shut your lying mouth. The name... Tom Monahan did ring a bell, as he was the creator and owner of the Domino's Pizza restaurant. But we had never actually met him in real life. Katie then started to say something about us never meeting him when the strange man cut her off screaming. He stole my name without my permission and used it to create a useless mascot. I remember being so confused as I had no idea what he was talking about. But as I traced his eyes, I realized that he was looking at the Noid figurines that I brought in that morning with a lot of hate in his eyes. I then watched as he threw them off the table and smashed them into bits. When he was done, he had a pained look on his face as he said, My life has been a living hell ever since those commercials came out. He's been telling people to avoid the Noid, to avoid me, and no one has done anything about it. The man then noticed the Noid-themed wristband that I had on as he said, So you're one of them? You're one of the numerous bullies who support this character? Well, guess what, you bastard? You're gonna die for liking the character that took everything away from me. And with that, he punched me in the mouth. I hadn't been in many fights throughout my life, so I didn't know how to take the punch. The impact of the blow made me fall headfirst into a pile of the now-broken Noid figurines, and I can never forget how I felt that day as I saw the blood from my busted lip drip onto the broken head of a Noid figurine. I remember asking myself, what had I done to deserve this? Up to that point in my life, I always thought that I would die of old age, but never in a million years did I think I would be killed for something as trivial as supporting or liking a mascot. The man then pointed the gun at my head as he told me, but before I kill you, I need you to do something for me. He ordered me to stand up as he forced me and Katie towards the restaurant's phone. 
He then pointed the gun at my head as he told me to call Domino's headquarters. I immediately dialed the number, and when the call went through, he took the phone from me and said, I currently have two of your employees as my hostages, and I'm ready to blow their brains out unless you bring me $100,000 in cash and a white limousine to get away from this dump and just to show you how serious I am, I'm going to give you a little show. The man then lifted his weapon and fired four shots into the floor. The sound of gunfire alerted the people listening to the call and the cops were called. Within minutes, the restaurant was surrounded and attempts were made to negotiate for our freedom. The cops called the man on the restaurant's phone and asked who he was and why he was doing this. The man then responded with, my name is Kenneth Lamar Noyd, and I'm doing all of this because of everything the owner of this filthy restaurant has done to me. The cops who were shocked now asked the man what the owner supposedly did to him. Mr. Kenneth then responded with, The man gang stalked me. I know because I saw him doing it and he broke into my own home without my permission. So you better bring what I ask for or I'm going to kill them. The man then threateningly pointed his gun at my head, and I remember for the first time that day, I wasn't scared by the gun that was being pointed at my head. No, what frightened me was actually the insane look in his eyes, as I knew then and there that this man was mentally unstable. My assumptions about his mental state were further proved, as when he was asked what he wanted to be given in exchange for our freedom, the man said, I'm willing to give you one of my hostages. The woman called Katie if you can provide me with a book called The Widow's Son. The officers, who were clearly shocked at his request, said nothing as they agreed to get the book. After a while, the book was retrieved, and when he was asked to release Katie, the man said, I don't want the book anymore, so the deal's off. Confused by his erratic behavior, the cops tried to reason with the man, but nothing worked. Over four hours had passed now, and things had remained the same. I remember how heightened my anxiety levels were as I struggled not to pass out. As I watched things play out, my fear began to rise higher as I knew being held hostage by an insane person was far worse than a normal hostage situation. I could tell Katie was scared, but she was much more composed as she knew we couldn't both break down. It had been six hours now and we still hadn't gotten anywhere. That's when Mr. Kendrick looked at us and said, no, it's been a while, and I need you both to be good hostages. So go and make me two special pizzas. At first, I was shocked at how calmly he made that request. It was as if he had forgotten the fact that he was still pointing a gun at our heads. We didn't argue as we did exactly what he asked for. Looking back on it now, I'm pretty sure that I made the best pizza ever as I knew my life depended on it. When we were done, we handed him the pizzas and I watched as he set his gun on his lap before starting to eat. We could tell he was pretty hungry as he solely focused on those pizzas, and for a split second, a crazy idea ran through my mind. I looked at Katie, and I could tell that she was thinking the same thing, so with no hesitation, we ran. As I bolted for the door, I remember making my peace with God as I thought he was going to shoot me in the back. But it took Mr. Kenneth a while to get himself together by picking up his gun. And before he could do that, we were already out of the door. We ran into the arms of the cops who immediately took us somewhere safe. It took a couple of minutes, but now that he didn't have any hostages, Mr. Kenneth had no choice but to give up. The morbid incident shook everyone in the city and investigations were carried into Mr. Kenneth's life. It was then revealed that Mr. Kenneth Lamar Noyd, who shared the same name as our mascot, the Noyd, had been a target of light mockery and bullying ever since the character gained popularity. And while everyone knew it was just a silly coincidence, Mr. Kenneth believed he was being specifically targeted by the owner of Domino's, Mr. Tom Monahan, as he made up scenarios claiming that they were both spying on his house and keeping him under surveillance. He also claimed the catchphrase, avoid the noid, was specifically created to make his life even worse. His family said that he would be enraged any time the Noid advertisements were shown on TV. And as the character grew more and more popular, he eventually couldn't take it anymore. So he decided to get his revenge on the Domino's Pizza Restaurant. Mr. Noid was given numerous charges during his trial, 
namely kidnapping, possession of a firearm, and extortion. After the trial, Mr. Noyd was deemed insane and he was sent to a mental institution for rehabilitation. It was there that he later killed himself on the 23rd of February, 1995. I quit my job after that and I had to undergo extensive therapy to help with the PTSD. Night after night, I found myself having nightmares about that day and it didn't take long before the Noid character started appearing in those nightmares as I would have dreams of a bloody red rabbit coming to shoot me in my sleep. It was then that I was told I had masculophobia. The psychologist told me the Noid character was a triggering element and that I should stay away from anything that would remind me of that day. Due to the bad press from the incident, Domino's pulled back all the advertisements for the Noid and within the next decade, the Noid became Domino's forgotten mascot. It's been over 33 years since this all happened. I thought I had gotten over the incident, but when I saw Domino's had revived the character in the year 2021, I had a terrible panic attack. It took me a while, but I've finally come to terms with the truth. As I know, there's nothing I can do to overcome this fear, and it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. On the bright side, I do find it ironic sometimes, as I know the only thing I can do now is to spend the rest of my days avoiding the Noid. It's been two years since this incident, but I can remember every detail of this story like it was yesterday. I was 17, and as a teenager, I wasn't really into social apps. I was the kind of teen you'd see with headphones on all the time, but as time passed, I guess I changed. The more friends I made, the more the need for these social apps became. Instagram came first, then Twitter, and then finally Snapchat. At first, I wasn't really enthusiastic about the app, but eventually, I grew to love it, and before I knew it, I was sending up to 16 snaps a day. Little did I know that, in the coming weeks, this app would lead to the worst experience of my life. I can remember the first message I received. I was in class with my friends, and we were talking about girl stuff, when my phone buzzed. At the time, I didn't realize it because I was really into the conversation. I'm guessing my friend Lucy saw it, so she called my attention to it. Claire, when did you start talking to boys we don't know about? I was taken aback by this statement, and the whole group became intrigued. What are you talking about? I replied. Then she held my phone up and said, Who's user 22? I quickly took my phone and saw the notification. I had received a voice note on Snapchat from someone called user 22. The person wasn't added as my friend, so that was odd. I don't know who this is. I replied. Come on, spill the beans, they said. But I kept saying that I was telling the truth and I really didn't know who it was. How do you know it's a boy anyway? I asked Lucy. Because no girl uses a name as bland as User22. Plus, you don't really talk to anyone apart from us. Deep down, I knew that was true. Even if I did start using social apps, I still only talked to my friends on it. So I guess I wasn't as social as I thought. I finally decided to play the message. I put on my headphones and pressed play. At first, it was nothing but silence for 30 seconds. Then I heard the crackling of a camera. Like the sound it makes when taking a picture, followed by a loud, guttery scream of a word, chate. The word sounded like someone who wasn't literate or someone who didn't know English well tried to pronounce the word chat. I was still in deep thought till my friends asked, so what does it say? So I took off my headphones and played the message. They too were in shock till Lucy started laughing. I remember asking her, what's so funny? And she said, it's probably a silly trend. Don't you get it? The clicking of a camera when taking a photo, snap, followed by a loud voice screaming the word chat, Snapchat. At that moment, that was the only plausible explanation. And with all the new trends and challenges on social media, it seemed to make sense. We all shrugged it off and went on with our day. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right with that message. In the coming weeks, I kept on receiving the same message at odd times of the day. In the middle of the night, after showering, or when I'm just walking down the street with my friends. Lucy said it was a trend, but apparently, it was only me getting these weird messages. I tried to talk to the person by asking, Who are you? What do you want from me? But user 22 never responded. He or she just kept on sending the same voice note over and over. With time, I'd just started to ignore it, and I told myself it was probably a bot or a glitch. 
I also didn't tell my friends because it really wasn't hurting anyone. On April 15th, a day which I'd come to remember, my parents were out of town for the weekend and I was sitting by the window reading a book and my phone buzzed. I picked it up and saw the same notification that I'd been seeing for weeks. Voice note from user 22. I don't know why, but I always played the message. Maybe I was waiting, hoping for it to be something different. I wasn't wearing my headphones, so I decided to play it out loud and it was the exact same thing. Snap. Jade. But this time after playing the message, I froze. Maybe it was because I wasn't wearing my headphones, but I could have sworn that I heard the sound of a camera taking a picture coming from outside while I played the audio. I was really scared, so I slowly turned around, and right there, outside my window, was a hooded man holding a camera. I screamed and expected him to run away, but he ran right towards me. Upon reaching the window, he realized that it was locked and he just stood there for 30 seconds staring at me. He then started screaming the word, Jade! 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 at the top of his lungs. I just stood there completely frozen and confused. But what he did next scarred me for life. He started using his own head to repeatedly bash in my window. I saw the glass cut his cheek and forehead, but he just continued to destroy my window with his face. By now, his hood was off and I could completely see his face. He looked like he was in his 60s. The hair on his head was tattered and in patches, and his teeth were black and rotten. I don't know why I didn't run. I don't know why I didn't call the police. I guess I couldn't. I was totally transfixed. I don't know if it was because of the fear, but all I could do was just stand there and take in the scene. My window finally broke, and the man whose face was completely disfigured let himself in. He held me by the shoulders and looked me in the eye. Up close, I could see his left eye was completely damaged and numerous shards of glass were sticking out of his face. My mind had already gone to a thousand places. I thought he was going to have his way with me and kill me. My mind screamed at me to do something, but my body fell limp. He opened his mouth and said the same words he'd been saying over and over. But this time, he said it in a calm voice and it sounded like a question. Cheat? His breath was so rancid, it smelled like feces, but I still didn't say anything. He repeated it again, this time with a little agitation in his voice. Cheat! I finally mustered up some courage and said, I don't understand. And without thinking, he hit me hard on my face and the force of the blow broke my nose. He then continued to shout, Cheat! 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 I remember at that moment, my mind told me I was going to die as I had already accepted it. Just then, I heard my name from outside. Claire? It's me, Miss Anderson, your neighbor. I heard a lot of noise and decided to check on you. Are you all right? I don't know where the strength came from, but I screamed. I screamed so hard, my lungs hurt. Claire, open the door right now. I heard Miss Anderson scream. The man, distracted by my neighbor, looked at the door, and I didn't hesitate to kick him between his legs. He screamed and I ran for my room. I got in and locked the door and it wasn't long till I heard footsteps from outside. I heard him banging the door screaming. I stayed on the floor of my room sobbing. It didn't take long before I started hearing police sirens. Soon after I heard, it's the police, followed by struggling from outside. Then everything died down. Then my door was broken down and a female cop walked in and asked me, are you okay? I looked outside and I saw two cops holding down the man who had broken into my house. It's okay, we've restrained him, she said. I remember running into her arms and crying my heart out. After the incident, I was taken to a hospital. My parents then immediately rushed home after hearing the news. I went to the station to give a statement and my dad demanded to know the identity of the man who did this to his daughter. We were told his name was Owen Connor. He was a war veteran before he joined the army, he used to be a photographer. After the war, he suffered many brain injuries and PTSD, which made him really violent. He tried to get back in tune with his family, but he was isolated due to his rage and violent outbursts. After an incident where he got violent with one of his family members, he was put into a psychiatric ward. He stayed there for six years. There his condition deteriorated and he lost many brain and speech functions. He escaped about six months ago 
and has been on the loose ever since. I remember asking, why did he come after me though, and how did he get my Snapchat ID? They said they found a phone on him. Upon going through it, they found out he used the app Snapchat as a way to get back in contact with his family. They said he looked up the name of his daughter, Claire, and Snapchat's generic search results probably brought up my name and he thought I was his daughter. They said he tracked me down using the Snap Map and followed me around for a while. Numerous pictures of me were also found on his camera. Even after all the therapy, I still remember that day and every time I go to events, be it weddings or birthdays, I am always afraid of the words, say cheese. Because once I hear the snap of a camera, I vividly hear his voice still screaming at me. Jait! Hi, my name is Frank, and what I'm about to tell you will make you eat homemade food forever. It was a Saturday afternoon when my friend Daniel rushed over to my house to inform me about the new Domino's pizza that had just opened down the street, and they'd be giving massive discounts for every pizza you buy on the opening night. Lucky customers would also take home free pizza packages. Free pizza? Count me in, I said. A week had passed and it was Sunday, the opening night of the new Domino's Pizza. Daniel and I were set to go and enjoy the food. It'll take less than 10 minutes to get there, so we decided to get drinks. We took a few shots before going to the opening night. We arrived at the new branch which was well decorated. You could tell that they had a special occasion. Daniel and I smiled at each other as we entered the new Domino's Pizza branch. Little did I know what I was getting into. We looked around and spotted an empty seat. We moved closer and sat down. Dan sat opposite me and passed me the menu, and I was delighted at the varieties on the menu. We finally made up our minds on what to order. I called the waiter and gave our orders. While waiting, I informed my friend Dan about the new job I'd be interviewing for the next day. I was excited about the job because I'd been jobless for a while. We waited for about five minutes more, and a waiter finally showed up with our pizza. But it wasn't the waiter who had initially taken our orders. It was a different waiter, and he seemed familiar. He was probably transferred from one of the many Domino's pizza branches I've been to, I thought. We dug into the pizza, and it was tasty. I suddenly felt a weird sensation as if someone was staring at me. I looked around, and to my surprise, the waiter who had served us was glaring at me. I felt worried instantly. When our eyes met, he looked away for a while, but he continued glaring. I was getting scared and wondering why he was glaring at me angrily like a maniac. A couple of minutes later, I began to feel woozy, and I told Dan, so he ordered an Uber and I was on my way home. When I got home, I was feeling lightheaded but I couldn't help but think about the weird waiter who was glaring at me. I took my mind off it and slept off. The next day, I woke up at precisely 12.54 p.m. My phone was right beside me, and it was buzzing like crazy because of all the texts and phone calls coming through from my uncle and my friends. I finally figured I missed the job interview I was supposed to go for. It was scheduled for 8.15 a.m., and my uncle, who set up the job interview for me, kept trying to reach me. He had called some of my friends to find out my whereabouts, and they wanted to contact me too. I only had a few shots. Why did I sleep for so long, I kept wondering. I called my uncle immediately, and he sounded very disappointed over the phone. He told me that someone else had been appointed for the job. I was sad. I needed that job. I burst into tears. The only hope I had was that job. I'm such a disappointment, I repeatedly said in tears. A few days had passed and Daniel came over to my apartment to check on me and cheer me up. After I narrated the weird incident to him about how I slept off and missed my interview, he said that the shots were probably too strong for me to handle that night and he stayed over for the night. Still, he had to leave early because he had a job, unlike me who was jobless. I decided to follow him to his house. He lives just five buildings away from mine. I saw him to his doorstep and I watched him enter his house. I couldn't enter, he was going to leave for work soon anyway. On my way back home, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. I was hungry. I needed to find something to eat instantly. I hadn't eaten anything nice in days. 
I moved further and went to the new Domino's Pizza to get a medium-sized pizza. It was early in the morning and there were only two workers when I got there, a friendly-looking waiter and the one who had brought us food the other night. He was busy arranging chairs and tables. Immediately he saw me and his expression changed. I forgot about this weird dude. I should have gone somewhere else for food, I said. I went to the other waiter and placed an order to go. He whistled at the weird waiter and he moved closer to me with a horrible scowl on his face. My heart skipped a beat and I told the other waiter I wanted him to take my order, not the weird one, and he said, I'm in charge of payment only and gave the paper he wrote my order to the odd waiter. I reluctantly accepted and sat down to wait. He was taking well over 10 minutes and I was getting impatient because I was famished. He finally showed up with the pizza already packaged and he passed it to me with a very creepy look. I looked at him confusingly and collected the pizza and exited the place. My hunger had increased tenfold when I got home. I opened the pizza quickly and started eating. I had only taken a couple of bites when I noticed that something was wrong. I could feel some tiny pieces of pizza moving in my mouth. I went to the fridge, drank water, and the disgusting taste of the pizza finally hit me. I drank water again, but this time I couldn't swallow. I threw it out into the sink by the fridge. I was freaked out by what I saw. Maggots. I rushed to the table where I placed the pizza and looked at it closely. I could see maggots all over the pizza. I was so disgusted and I vomited instantly and kept on purging and retching for many hours. The entire day had gone by and I still couldn't get over what I'd been through. I called Daniel and we made our way to Domino's Pizza to make angry complaints and outraged protests. It was very late but we didn't care. We arrived there, but they were closed. We were furious and disappointed. We had planned to turn the place upside down and call them out for their disgusting service. We went back to my apartment, and when we got back home, we met Domino's Pizza Boxes at my doorstep. Daniel asked me why I ordered more pizza after what had just happened, and I told him that I didn't order any pizza, and we both stood there in shock. I moved forward to check the pizza. It gave off a horrible stench. It smelled like a dead animal. I opened the pizza box and it was pizza with blood all over. I dropped it instantly and fell back. I stumbled by the door and fell. Daniel was still looking at the pizza in shock. I was terrified. Daniel summoned courage, picked up the pizza, threw it in the trash and took me into my room. I was confused and scared. What the hell is going on? I asked Daniel. We're calling the police, he said. I barely slept that night and kept checking the time. As soon as it was 6 a.m., I woke Daniel and we headed to Domino's Pizza again. Only two people were there again, a girl in charge of payments and another male waiter. We gave our complaints and showed them a picture of the pizza with maggots. They pleaded with us continuously. I asked about the guy that served me the pizza package and we were told that he had quit his job that same day. Daniel called the police and we proceeded to the station. I informed the police about what had happened and they said they would conduct an investigation. The waiter who served me the disgusting pizza was summoned to the station. His name was Lambert Gerald. I finally figured out why his face seemed familiar. We were in the same department in the university. We never really got along in the university because he was from a lower class family and I was always hanging out with group of friends who bullied and insulted him in school. I didn't partake in the bullying, but I didn't stop it either. The police pressured him about the maggots. He confessed and admitted that he put maggots into my pizza and quit his job knowing that I would come back and he was afraid of getting caught. He also confessed to placing the bloody pizza in front of my apartment. The horrible part of his confession was that he had placed pills in the pizza I ordered on the opening night. He overheard me talking to my friend about my job interview. He wanted to make me miss the interview, so he quickly went to a pharmacy nearby to get sleeping pills and mixed a very high dosage in my pizza. 
He must have been hurt by what we did to him in school and was out for revenge. It turns out he had a previous criminal record of assault and stalking. I wasn't his only victim. He had also done similar things to my group of friends then. I still feel disgusted whenever I see or smell Domino's Pizza. I get asked the question, why aren't you on Snapchat up to 10 times a day? And while I've told so many generic lies that I can't remember, the truth behind it is something that's really hard to talk about. My name is Hazel Phillips, and this is the true story behind all the lies. I was 21 at the time. I was in my prime college years. I went out drinking every weekend, partied hard when I got the chance, and incessantly felt the need to update everyone on social media about every single detail in my life. While I loved these years of my life, I still can't remember most of it because I couldn't hold my liquor. I would spend numerous amazing nights out drinking, and after coming back home, I would wake up the next day clueless as to what happened the night before. My friends always made jokes about it every night, but it was all in good fun. Around that time, there was this huge party that was coming up around the weekend, and I can remember getting so hyped for it. Little did I know that this was the last party I was going to be attending for a while. When Saturday finally came, I got out my best dress and I got all dolled up. Earlier that morning, my brother told me he was going to be coming to town to see me. So I knew I had to comport myself at the party and drink a little so I wouldn't be wasted by the time he showed up tomorrow. I met up with my friends and we headed for the party. When we got there, I remember being in awe as the party was truly amazing. Everything from the venue to the lights, it was really the ultimate party. I didn't hesitate to take out my phone and take snaps of everything I saw. I can remember my friend Kristen made a joke. She said, don't drink and snap, Hazel. And we all laughed. So at this point, I had been mindful of my drinking. I made sure not to drink too much. I had also been checking the time because I knew I had to leave a bit early since my brother was arriving tomorrow. While I tried my best to gauge my drinking, I still went a little overboard, but I was sure I could handle it. I bid my friends goodbye and ordered a cab. While I was waiting outside for the cab, I got the eerie feeling that someone was watching me. I remember feeling really nervous. I was about to go back into the party when the taxi finally arrived. I quickly got in and told the driver my address. I felt a bit safer during the ride. When I finally got home, I paid the cabman and I started walking down to my apartment. I reached the door and I started fumbling around for my keys. I still couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me, but I just brushed it off saying it's just my female insecurities and my mind playing games on me. I finally got in and without changing clothes, I laid down on my bed and slept. The next morning was really bizarre. My phone had like a thousand snap messages from all the people on my friends list. There were numerous messages, but they all said the same thing. You're one crazy girl. I thought you said you had a little to drink. You're cracking me up. Go inside. Don't hurt yourself with those knives. Go to bed. I said go to bed, not go to the cupboard. It took me a while to wrap my head around all these messages, but I soon realized that all my friends were reacting to snap pictures I didn't send. Judging by the timestamps, I was sleeping at that time, or at least I thought I was. I decided to handle it later and I went to do all my morning activities. I was having a slight headache and I don't know why, but I thought I was hearing deep breathing noises coming from my old cupboard. I again brushed this off saying it's probably because of my mini hangover. I had a few classes at college before my brother showed up. When I got to class, I waited behind to see my friends so that I could ask them about the weird snaps, but apparently they partied really hard that night so they couldn't come to class. Right then, I got a message from my brother saying he decided to surprise me with an early visit and that he's at my apartment right now. I told him I was at school and I'm probably going to stay a while so he should just use a spare key and let himself in. Throughout the whole day, my mind was on those weird messages I opened my Snapchat gallery to see if I could find the pictures people were reacting to. But there was nothing there. 
I texted some of my friends asking them what they were reacting to, but they were still giving weird answers. It also didn't help that the snaps vanished after a while. I finally decided to go home and meet my brother. When I reached my apartment, I saw that Kristen had come online. I remember texting her, Hey girl, I really don't remember sending any snaps last night after the party. And she replied, You really can't remember? I knew you were lying when you said you had a little to drink. But don't worry, I took a screenshot of all the weird snap you took yesterday. I'll send them to you in a minute. I remember thinking, finally, now I can understand what's going on. I had gotten into my apartment before I received the pictures. The house was awfully quiet. I remember calling out to my brother, Tristan, I'm home. Where's my bear hug? No reply. I thought to myself, he probably stepped out for a minute. I sat on my bed and took off my shoes, and I opened Snapchat to see the photos. The photos were all really dark and poorly lit, and the figure in the snaps were wearing my old pink bathrobe that I kept in my old cupboard. There were four pictures in total. The first one was taken in the corridor with the lights dimmed out. I couldn't see the person's face, but by the hair and figure of the person, I could tell it was a woman. She was surrounded by what seemed to be my underwear. The snap was tagged with hashtag feeling sexy. I immediately started feeling anxious as I didn't see any of my underwear in the corridor this morning to my knowledge. They were all still in my drawer. Plus, I never used hashtags while tagging my snaps. The second one was taken outside on the street in another poorly lit environment and it was tagged with hashtag feeling hungry. Again, I thought to myself, even if I did all those things, there's no way I wouldn't remember going outside. The feeling of fear began to set in now. In the third snap, this person was back in my apartment, in the kitchen to be precise, with my really expensive Robert Welch signature knife block set. And it was tagged with hashtag my wonderful knife set. I remember my mom, who was a huge chef, got me that knife set. She was always adamant on getting me to like cooking, but I really didn't. And the only reason I could remember the name of the knife set was because she never stopped talking about it and how expensive it was. I had since put it away in my top shelf, and again, there was no way I wouldn't remember getting it down no matter how drunk I was. And last night, I was pretty sure I wasn't even close to being drunk. By now, I was petrified, and I knew for sure that someone was in my house taking snaps with my phone and uploading them. But the last snap cleared any doubt I had left. It showed the figure in my old cupboard holding one of the big knives from the set, and it was tagged with hashtag beds drool, cupboards rule. And at that moment, it's as if everything became quiet and the deep breathing sounds I thought I imagined this morning coming from my old cupboard became really clear now. I knew the person who was here last night was still here with me. I can remember reaching for my lamp and in a split second, a woman with long black oily hair busted out of my cupboard and lunged at me with a bloody knife. The knife made contact with my skin and it was rammed deep in my shoulder. The pain was unbearable. I can remember screaming out. I tried looking at her, but her face was totally covered by her hair. All that was going through my mind was I can't die today. I swung the lamp pretty hard with my other hand and it landed right on her face. The woman who I had just hit with the huge glass lamp on her face didn't scream. She was only phased for a little while. I remember kicking her back with all my strength. Once she fell, I ran towards the living room. It didn't take long before she caught up to me. She pushed me to the ground where we started to struggle. I remember my eyes darting rapidly looking for something to hit her with because she still had the knife in her hand. And not so far from me was my brother's baseball bat. Again, with all the strength I could muster, I kicked her off of me again and reached for the baseball bat. It was really painful to pick up due to the bleeding gash on my shoulder, but I didn't care. I swung with all my might and I hit her really hard on the face. She instantly fell on the floor. 
She began to show signs of movement, so I hit her again with the bat on her back, and I heard a crack sound. She instantly stopped moving. I literally thought I killed her. I don't know why I didn't freak out. I guess my body's adrenaline was still in control. I immediately ran to my room, got my phone, and called the cops, and I told them everything that had happened. They said they were on their way, and I should try to leave my apartment if I can, as the attacker could still be conscious. I ran to the door, but it was already open. I looked in the living room, and the woman I thought I killed wasn't there. I started to notice blood coming from the kitchen. I don't know why, but I went to the kitchen, and the scene I saw messed me up for life. I saw my brother's corpse, and there was a stab wound through his neck. I remember breaking down there and crying. It wasn't long till I heard the cops come in. They found me and my brother. I passed out due to loss of blood. When I woke up, my mom was there. I was told to give a statement and I did. My mom asked for the identity of the woman, but they said they had no idea who she was. They also said that she had killed my brother earlier when he was at my apartment waiting for me which explained why the knife was bloody before she stabbed me. The murder weapon that they would have analyzed for fingerprints wasn't found. They asked me to describe her, and I couldn't because I didn't really see her face as her hair covered most of her face. So I could only remember her eyes. The cops said they were on the case, and they will find my brother's murderer and bring her to justice. But... To this day, she hasn't been found, and she's still out there. It's been four years since this incident ruined my life. I never finished college, and I moved back in with my mom. I also left and ghosted all the friends I had made in college. And while I still seem normal, deep down inside, I'm boiling with grief, pain, anger, and resentment. So, if you're the sick freak who broke into my house and killed my brother, I know you're still out there, and if you're hearing this, I have a message for you. I want my knife back. Hello friends, my name is Ashton, and I've been a fan of hiking since I was a little kid. I love everything about it, seeing new things, spotting wild creatures, and of course the beautiful nature. Hiking has turned into a lifelong hobby for me, but deep down, I've always had a feeling that this hobby would one day overwhelm me. Well today, I'm going to share with you a story of a hazardous incident that happened to me one day while I was out on a hike. The area I was in was famous for its peaceful scenery, complete with beautiful peaks that offered amazing views over the valley. I had heard a lot about that area amongst my local hiking community and couldn't wait to see it for myself. I geared up for my adventure and this time, I decided to bring along my dog, Sumo. Sumo had hiked with me before and was a wonderful companion on the trail. I loaded up my car with all my gear and we headed off. The hike was fairly straightforward but did include some light rock scrambles and climbing, which I had to help Sumo over some of them. But he didn't mind much. He loves being carried. Now there's a point when I'm on a hike when I hit this kind of meditative state where I just walk, sometimes without even realizing how far I've traveled but this time it was Sumo who barked at me, breaking me out of my trance and telling me that we needed to slow down and take a break. So I did and realized just how tired I really was. I looked around for a good spot to take a break and that's when I saw what seemed to be an opening of a deep cave. We ventured into the mouth of the cave and both started feeling really hungry. So I took out my camp stove and some snacks for Sumo and we sat down for a nice dinner. Sumo barked his approval. After our meal, we both started to doze off from our full stomachs. A rest was well earned. When I woke up the next day, I saw that my wife, Brooklyn, and my daughter, Avista, had decided to hike the trail as well, and somehow, they caught up to me and found me in the cave. It was so bizarre. But seeing their faces was such a great gift that my excitement pushed my suspicion out of the way. When I finally confronted them on how and why they were here in the middle of the woods in some cave, they simply said that they missed me so much, and they just had to meet me. For some reason, I was content with this answer and couldn't help but smile. My daughter came running to me and hugged me tight. I love you, Daddy, she said. Well, I had planned for a few more days of hiking past this cave, but since you guys are here, I don't see why we can't just set up a nice camp and 
Head back in two days or so, I said as my wife and daughter nodded in agreement. We had a lot of fun in that cave. We cooked, danced, sang songs, told stories, made shadow puppets on the cave wall. My daughter enjoyed those a lot. And we all took time to play with Sumo. The deeper we would venture into the cave, the more our surroundings seemed to change. And on the far side of it, a massive drop-off would open up to a gorgeous view. My wife and I would go back there while a vista would be playing with Sumo. And we'd just sit and take in the views. But after two days, both my daughter and my wife would start to change slightly. I would start to pack up our camp and try to get them to leave the cave, but they would refuse. And I couldn't understand why they wanted to stay so badly. But the day was growing late, and we were all becoming hungry, so I decided to cook one last meal for us. What's one more day? Everything was quiet while I was cooking. It was just the sound of the fire crackling and the water boiling. When suddenly, I heard what sounded like animal claws on the ground behind me, and I saw quick flashes of a shadow pass me on the wall. I turned around, frightened, only to find that there was nothing there. I turned back to the fire, weary about my surroundings. When it felt like something had jumped on me from behind, I screamed, shook it off, and ran towards the wall to the cave, pressing my back against it. I reached out to my wife with fear in my eyes. Brooklyn, hey, di did you just see that? What was that thing? Did you hear anything? Hello? Honey? She didn't respond. My wife was catatonic. She was just standing there, unmoving, with her jaw slightly open, not saying a word. I peered into her eyes, which seemed to just gaze at nothing somewhere off into the distance, when suddenly they began burning with a red-hot glow. I jumped back, nearly tripping over Sumo and Avista, who were sitting right behind me, staring intensely into the fire. I apologized for almost stepping on them, but they didn't respond. But in unison, they jerked their heads toward me with a screech sharing the same red glow to their eyes as my wife. I screamed again and began backing up from all three of them. It was then that a deep, unsourced evil chuckle began rising from all three of them. It grew and grew until they were nearly screaming while they were laughing. My vision started to blur and my head became foggy. It was hard to hold on to any one single thought. My head started to feel incredibly heavy and it became a massive endeavor just to hold it up. Finally, my neck gave way to the weight of it, and my only choice was to look down. It was then that I noticed blood coming out of my left hand and all over my leg. Two injuries I had no recollection of getting. I wobbled, and right before my vision went black, my wife, daughter, and dog all seemed to be stepping towards me. I woke the next day to find Sumo lying unconscious at my feet. I checked to see if he was breathing, but I felt nothing. Sumo was dead. I burst into tears. Unable to control it, I divulged into a forceful sob. It was then that I truly felt my injuries. My left hand seemed to be shattered, with multiple bones broken, and I could feel the smallness of my stomach and every single one of my ribs showing, suggesting that I hadn't eaten or drank water in much too long. I felt fragile as I cried. I once again faded into unconsciousness. When I woke up again, I found myself in a hospital bed, with IVs sticking out of my arm, and my daughter and my wife sitting at the foot of my bed. I took a confused look around the room when a doctor walked in and saw that I was awake. Mister, you're one lucky guy. You seem to have survived inside that cave for 16 days. A massive storm had swept through the area which must have washed debris and larger rocks over the exit, trapping you and your dog inside. It seemed that you have broken your hand via some sort of blunt force trauma. I can assume a rock had fallen on top of it during an attempted escape of some sort. Unfortunately, your dog did die due to lack of food and water. He most likely didn't last long though, but thankfully, you had done the responsible thing and told your wife where you would be hiking, and after you didn't come home, well, she set out to find you, and finally she did. I sat there in shock. Hearing events that I had no memory of, I shuddered and recoiled from my wife and my daughter as they went to hug me, thinking back to those burning red eyes. Was this another trick the cave was playing on me? Did it finally have me where it wanted me, losing my mind and shunning away my loved ones? Only time will tell, but I will not give in to the evil of that place. That being said, I probably won't be going back on that hike anytime soon. My name's Roy, and I'm 25 years old. Since I moved out on my own, I've been very cautious. I lock all the doors, close all the windows, and make sure I have all the police and emergency numbers handy. 
People call me paranoid, but not everyone knows how dangerous it can be to give someone a chance to enter your home because you don't know who you might meet. I learned this lesson the hard way 15 years ago. And every time I question whether I'm being too exaggerated, I remember what happened that night and realize that a little extra security never hurts. I was only 10 years old, and it was my first night alone. My parents were divorced, and my dad wasn't a big fan of babysitters, as he didn't trust inviting a stranger into your home to watch your child. I usually live with my mother, but she had to go on a business trip. And although my father spent every weekend with me, on weekdays, I didn't know anything about his life. My mother forced my dad to take care of me for that week, and my dad told her that he was taking a vacation to be with me, but he lied. He had already taken a leave a month ago to go to another country with his new girlfriend, and even though he didn't tell me, I saw his messages with her, and I knew it was true. Without the vacation, my dad got engaged to my mom, and when he talked to me, he told me that he had to work, and that I could take care of myself. I was already old, and he knew that I was very responsible. He promised me not to say anything to my mom, and I agreed. I wanted to be alone too. It was my chance to prove to the world that I could take care of myself. When he left for work, my dad locked all the doors and left me the keys. He also left me all the emergency numbers close by, with his on top of everything if anything should happen. He also left me prepared food that I only had to reheat and lots of treats to eat only after dinner. He told me that to make sure I did everything, there were cameras all over the house and that he would watch me at all times, but I knew that was a lie. Otherwise, he would have told me before or shown them to me. After all this, my father grabbed all the stuff and left, leaving me alone in his apartment. The moment he left, I was running to open the candy and stuffed all of it in my mouth without a second thought. I knew that after dinner, I would want to eat more, so I saved a few for later and went to watch TV. After a few minutes, I fell asleep with my belly full of treats and the TV on. I was dreaming about my pets at my mom's house until suddenly a loud noise woke me up. The doorbell was ringing incessantly as if someone who knew the place wasn't empty had been ringing for a while. I was terrified that I hadn't slept all day and the doorbell ringer was my angry dad. But when I saw the time, I realized that it would still be a long time before he arrived. I put on my flip flops and approached the door. On the other side was a woman. She looked familiar but I couldn't try to remember who she was. I asked her what she wanted, and she told me she was the neighbor my dad sent to take care of me. I told her that my dad had left me alone, but she said he changed his mind on the way downstairs and sent her to make sure everything was okay for a few minutes. I wasn't sure if I believed her, but within seconds she said, come on, open up Roy, or your dad'll get mad. This woman looked very familiar. She knew my father was working and knew my name, so I believed her and opened up. As she walked in, she thanked me with a strange smile and started asking me if I had done my homework, to which I replied surprisingly that I was on vacation since it was the middle of January. She just laughed, ignored me, and told me to watch TV and hurried into my father's room. I saw out of the corner of my eye what she was doing, and she was rummaging through everything as if she was looking for something. I asked what she was doing, and she told me that my father had told her to get his money from him and to give it to her because she wanted to buy a surprise for his favorite son. At that moment, I didn't notice how strange it was that my father didn't know where his own money was, and I just got excited about the surprise I was going to get. After a few minutes, the girl violently broke the drawer of a closed cabinet and took out a pile of money, to which she reacted by <laughs> laughing frantically. She stuffed everything into a bag and was leaving but I stopped her and asked her to warm up my food before she left. At first, she just looked at me angrily, but then she gave me a big smile and said she'd be happy to warm up my food. Suddenly, she rushed over to me and hugged and squeezed me violently. I started to cry in desperation, but she paid no attention. Just pulled me over to the kitchen chair and told me to stay still or she would hurt me. Terrified, I obeyed. The girl tied me to the chair with a rope she had found while going through my father's things and started boiling water. She would probably make me the noodles my dad had on top of the fridge. I told her I wasn't hungry anymore, but she ignored me. After a few minutes, she asked if I was thirsty and wanted some water, 
to which I told her I'd prefer some orange juice. I asked her if she could untie me since the ropes were tight and again, she did not answer me. I wanted to ask her if she would serve me juice, but my thoughts were interrupted by an indescribable sensation of pain. The girl was pouring all the hot boiling water slowly on my head. She was dripping it slowly and the water was running all over my face and body. I screamed desperately and tried to free myself, but there was no solution. I felt my face starting to melt and my vision beginning to blur. The girl started to run the hot water all over the rest of my body, ensuring that none of my parts were dry, while she laughed non-stop. When she ran out of the water, I was still screaming, to which she reacted by slapping me hard across the face as she continued to laugh. Almost without understanding anything, I heard banging on the door and voices asking me if everything was alright. The woman went to open the door and worriedly told the neighbors that I had an accident and needed help. As the neighbors came in to see me, she ran out of the house in desperation, taking all my father's money with her. The neighbors who came to help me saw me and screamed in surprise when they saw my condition, and they untied me and desperately called the ambulance. I was never able to recover from what happened. I received permanent wounds and marks all over my body and could not leave the hospital for a long time. Eventually, I found out that that woman was my dad's ex-girlfriend, with whom he had gone on a vacation a month before, but they had a very violent fight. The girl looked familiar to me because some of the pictures I saw of her when I was checking my father's cell phone. And I also remembered how I had seen them arguing loudly in chat rooms, and she constantly threatened to hurt me, but my father never took her seriously. After the hospital, I didn't see my father for years, not because he didn't want to see me, but because my mother denied him until I was of age and could decide independently. My father didn't try to take any legal action against her, as he felt very guilty about what happened and felt that maybe he deserved it. Today my relationship with him has improved a little, but I never go into his apartment again, because every time I see him from a distance, the marks that are permanently left on my skin start to burn again. My name's Ethan. I'm 26, and I love the internet. It's vast, almost as big as the real world. On the internet, people play, work, entertain themselves, study, get information, express their opinions, buy and sell, and do so many other things that are also done in the tangible world, sometimes even creating significant events in what we biasly call reality. However, like any large and complex space, the internet has its dark alleys, its forbidden passages. I'm referring to the deep web. This is the hidden face of the internet, the massive iceberg of which we barely know the tip that emerges above the waters. Most people are unaware of it, but the deep web represents about 90% of the information in cyberspace. Ever since I learned that the deep web existed, I wanted to get to know it and dive into its murky waters. I had my fears, but my curiosity was much more significant, and after a while of thinking about it, I decided to at least take a little look. I started by entering directly to level 3. Here begins what is forbidden on the official web. Pages whose characters are randomly dropped. Pages that cannot be displayed in search engines and that you cannot see even if you copy the entire link and paste it in the address bar. In this level, there are strange, disturbing, or simply useless things. Webs abandoned for more than 13 years. Materials that by copyright are not found in the official web, or were found but are no longer there. Markets of weapons, drugs, instructions on how to make bombs and other things that lend themselves to the illegal, and videos and photos of murders. It was already said that in the previous level, there was solid gore material, but here, there are live murders, assassins, and even trade in human organs. As the hours passed, I started getting bored and advanced to the next level. If in the previous story, there were compromising things for governments, in this level, there are military secrets in the most lurid and inhumane state projects. Here, you will know what missile that countries are hiding is, what cybernetic weapons are hidden, and who has the most lethal biological weapons, things like that. I entered out of curiosity to one of the famous Red Room videos, and I saw how they murdered a young man of no more than 20 years old. The boy was begging for mercy with all his strength. 
told them that he had family waiting for him, that he never did wrong to anyone. Before murdering him, they sent a poll to the viewers asking them if they should let him live, to which I voted yes. Unfortunately, the rest of the viewers disagreed with me, so the man moved forward again and opened the young man's neck with a precise and quick movement. The camera zoomed in on his gaze as he made a futile attempt to cover his wound by lowering his neck. So, as quickly as it started, the show was over. The lights were turned off, while some men came in to clean up to prepare for the next show. I felt like throwing up and decided to leave as quickly as possible. I wanted to advance to the next level, where there were no more murders, but state secrets and information that people would never know. It took me a long time to get in, but when I finally got in, I understood why everyone stayed in the lower levels. As soon as I logged in, my PC restarted by itself without anything weird popping up on the screen or the power going out. When the reboot process was finally complete, I saw that my hard drive had been wiped. On the entire desktop, there was only one file from the notes blog, placed right in the center of the screen, as if to make me notice it. I opened it. Its message was brief, blunt, and somewhat threatening. Don't do it again. I got so scared that I didn't enter the deep web for several days. In that time, I reinstalled a few things to a backup I had of my data. I thought that was the worst of it, that losing all my data was the most significant punishment I could suffer. I was wrong. A few days later, my curiosity got the better of me, and I logged into Tor and entered the first deep web forum I could find. Of course, I wasn't even at an advanced level yet but my PC restarted by itself, and the data was deleted again. Although now, there was no message on the desktop. Was I banned from the deep web from my computer forever? 20 minutes after the reboot and formatting, I knew better. The doorbell rang. I asked who it was from the door's phone, and no one answered. Then, I went down to the front door of the building, but no one was there. Only an envelope was waiting for me, just under the door. It had no return address, addressee, or anything written on it, although I sensed it was for me. I went back upstairs to my apartment, went into my room, and just there, opened the envelope once I was sitting on my red carpet. Ethan, this is not a game. Don't do it again. Don't make us come after you. As I read it, my hands began to shake, and tears slipped down my cheeks. Whoever they were, they knew who I was, where I lived, what I did, and when. To top it off, next to the message was a picture of me taken with my webcam. Next to it, pictures of my family, my friends, even my little sister who was still in kindergarten. In an act of desperation, I grabbed the phone and dialed the police number. I had no idea what to say to them when they answered. Deep inside, I knew there was nothing they could do. But before I answered, I saw through the computer's reflection a hooded man with his face covered coming right at me. When I turned around to defend myself, it was too late. The man grabbed my head and began slamming it against my keyboard. As he did so, I heard his voice, distorted by a device, telling me, I told you, this is not a game. I was still dizzy and thought about mustering all my strength to get away, but suddenly, I felt a cold prick in my arm. A few seconds later, I became very sleepy, and surrendering to whatever they had injected me with, I closed my eyes. When I woke up, my house was in perfect condition, but something was wrong with the computer. It wouldn't turn on. After checking in, I noticed that it was missing the hard drive, video card, processor, and RAM. The man who had visited me had taken the most expensive components and had rendered it useless. But at the time, I didn't care. I was so terrified that week. I asked at work to be transferred to another city. I never entered the deep web again. And I don't think I will ever try it again, no matter where I am in the world. Fate had been cruel to me. But after remembering how I was at the mercy of this man, asleep, it makes me think that despite everything, I am fortunate to be alive. Remember when you were a kid and you had a crush on someone? You would get a thrill out of walking past their house or calling them and hanging up. It was mostly girls who did that. I got a few who walked past my house then, call and hang up. 
It used to creep me out at the time, but now I would take that over the latest girl to take an interest in me. I'm John, and this is my story of how a girl I deliver pizza to nearly took my life. It started one night when an order was placed during our final operating hours. It was my last delivery, and it was a bit of a drive, but I didn't mind. I pulled up to the respective address and knocked on the door. The person that answered it was an obese woman. She smelled as though she hadn't showered in years. Her hair was matted and her teeth looked like they were coated in butter. I gave her my most customer-friendly smile and handed her pizza to her. Hi, ma'am. Here's your stuffed crust meat lover's pizza with extra cheese and bacon. That'll be $18.36. She took the pizza and made sure her hand touched mine. She let out a little girlish giggle. <laughs> you can call me Cindy. I nodded. A sure thing, Cindy. You can come in while I get my wallet. No, thank you. It's best for our safety if I wait uh, right out here. There had been some recent cases of pizza delivery guys going missing, so I wasn't taking any chances. She frowned. Oh, come on. I don't bite. I'm waiting here. She pouted and slammed the door shut. For a minute, I thought she was going to take the pizza and not pay. It had me wondering if I made a mistake not going inside or not. I stood there for a few tense minutes, waiting it out. About five minutes later, she finally opened the door. She gave me a 20, and she flashed her cleavage at me, a 5 wedged in it. Some of your tip is in that 20, but if you want the rest, you're going to have to come get it. <laughs> she let out another girlish giggle. I rolled my eyes. I'll just take this. Have a good night. What's your name? This is where I made the biggest mistake. John, I'll be seeing you again. I waved her off and headed to my car. I drove back to the pizza place, sorted out my tips for the day, and went home. The next night around the same time, we had gotten a call for an extra large stuffed crust with extra cheese and bacon pizza. Henry, my manager, hollered for me. John, you're taking this one. Customer's request. In this industry, people didn't usually ask for a specific driver to deliver their food. Most people ordering pizza just want their food, no matter how it gets there, as long as it's fresh and hot. Is this your fancy way of just giving it to me? I joked. Henry arched a brow at me. No, the customer really asked for you. I don't want to take it. She was weird. Time is money, John. She's given me no reason to lose her business. She paid online, so all you have to do is collect your tip. She held a five between her boobs and told me to come get it. Did you? No. Just drive the pizza to her and maybe next time we'll work out a tip over the phone. I hoped that there wouldn't be a next time, but something in my gut suggested that there would indeed be a next time. Then another, then another. This customer was going to cost me more tips than it's worth. I drove out there and it was the same ordeal wanted me to come in so she could get her wallet. I refused and again handed me a 20. Except this time, two fives were wedged in her cleavage. John, these are yours. If you just grab them. I ignored her and went to my car. Every day for weeks, I had to deliver a pizza to this woman. I realized that this wasn't ever going to end. So on my days off, I went looking for another job. I managed to get a job as a driver for another pizza place that paid more. The pizza was gourmet and high-end, so they were more expensive. Cindy had a $100 bill wedged in her cleavage, and when I really looked at it, I could see crumbs and bits of sauce that had to be from the time I started delivering to her. The bill had some yellow residue on it as though she used it as floss. I have never rejected $100 in my life, but that night, I would. Little did I know, she would force me to have it, one way or another. Cindy grabbed my face and shoved it between her breasts. She told me to lick off all the crumbs and sauce. I refused, and she knocked me out. I wasn't sure how much time passed when I finally woke up. I had a tape over my mouth, and my hands and feet were hogtied together. It was dark, cold, and it smelled like death. 
Suddenly, I heard the creaking of a rusty door opening and heavy footsteps making their way down. Great. I was in a damn basement. A light switched on, and all around me, I saw at least three men tied up with chains. I recognized their faces on the missing posters put up all over town. They looked as though they had been down there for months, as that's how long they had been missing. Johnny... I heard Cindy call out in a sing-song voice. She came down and smiled, seeing I was awake. She clapped her hands and jumped up and down. Every ounce of fat jiggled and the stench between each roll permeated. It was so intense, I gagged. Cindy came and ripped the tape off my mouth. Johnny, I just want you to fulfill a fantasy of mine. I just want to have sex with one pizza delivery boy. Please. Crazy bitch, let me go. She slapped me and grabbed my head, forcing me to look at the other guys. See them? They refuse to fulfill my fantasy. I won't release them until they do. Do you want to be down here, like them? I looked at them. They looked so dirty and malnourished. And unless I gave this rotting cow her fantasy, I would be just like them. I looked up at Cindy. Okay, if that's all you want. She smiled and brushed my cheek. Call me baby. Yes, baby. Let's go make all your wildest dreams come true. With luck, she believed me and cut the zip ties that bound me. She looked at the other guys. See this? It's that easy to go home. We went all the way upstairs to her bedroom that was infested with roaches and a mattress covered in cat piss. She grabbed my face and kissed me roughly. Her breath was like someone took a shit in an ashtray. Baby, I am really thirsty. Can I get a glass of water so that I can perform my best? Anything for you, Johnny. She went to leave the room and turned around. Come with me, of course. With quick thinking, as we got to the stairs, I used what was left of my strength and shoved her down the stairs as hard as I could. Her body tumbled, and on the way down, her neck snapped, killing her instantly. I puked my guts out and ran down to my car, where I had stupidly left my phone and called the cops. The other guys were rescued. I wasn't criminally charged, as my shoving her down the stairs was self-defense. It turned out that Cindy was a woman who had killed her husband that was a pizza delivery driver. She wanted to feel that connection to him again. I still deliver pizzas, but I now go through no contact delivery. This happened to me the final summer I was working at Pizza Hut. I picked up some shifts to earn a little extra money here and there. I used to work for three to five hours either working in the kitchen or delivering pizzas. It had been a difficult day for me, and I was tired. It was almost nighttime and I had to deliver my final pizza. I picked it up from the shop and got in my car. I put the address into the GPS to check how far it was. It turned out it was 20 minutes away, so I started driving. I was exhausted, so I just wanted to deliver it and go to my apartment to rest. As I got closer and closer to the location, the area was getting less and less crowded. This person didn't live in a crowded neighborhood. That's what I thought to myself. When I got there, the house seemed to be old. It was the quietest neighborhood I had ever seen in this area. Anyways, I took the pizza out of the car and went towards the main door. I rang the doorbell, and an old man came to open the door. As soon as he had opened the door, he told me to put the pizza on the table and that my money was there. After saying this, he left. I was a little confused, but I entered the house. The hallway was dark and quiet. I had to turn on my phone's flashlight. This place had no light bulbs, which was odd to me. There was a table located in the middle of the living room. I reached for it and placed the pizza box there. My money was also on the table. I quickly pocketed it. Suddenly, 
the door shut behind me with a loud bang, and I heard a click, as if someone was locking it. I was startled. I pointed my flashlight towards the door and ran for it, but the door was locked. My cell phone had low charge, and it was about to die. I attempted to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Just then, my smartphone began to ring. I looked at the screen to see it was an unknown caller. I answered the call to listen to a hoarse whisper on the opposite end. If you don't do what I say, you're dead, son, he whispered. I asked who was speaking. You don't ask questions. Don't worry. I will help you across soon, said the man. I asked him what he wanted, but he just stated that he desired to have fun. He instructed me to look underneath the table. I did so, and found a phone there. My phone started to heat up, to such an extent, it was burning my hand, Ow. and I had to throw it away from me. I got a video call on the phone underneath the table. I pressed answer, and noticed an ordinary guy wearing a mask. I told him to let me go. I didn't do anything. In response, he informed me to visit the bedroom. I walked there slowly, and my hand shook as I held the smartphone in front of me. I opened the door to see that there was a timer on the side desk. What is this for? I requested in a manic state. That's how long you've got left in this world. He started to chuckle. I hung up on him and desperately tried to look around the room for something I could use as a weapon. There was nothing. Feeling helpless, I went to the window, only to find it was barred from the outside. I ran to the bathroom. I only had an hour and a half left. I looked around the walls and found a small exhaust window in the upper corner. Of course, it wasn't very large. I stood on the brink of the bathtub and turned on my phone's flashlight directing its beam at the window. I waved my hand for someone to notice me from the outside. Help! I shrieked at the pinnacle of my lungs. I screamed until my throat got sore, and I couldn't shout anymore. I heard beeping, so I raced to the bedroom to find the clock counting right down to the final minutes of my life. I was panicking, not knowing what to do, and thinking about what would happen as soon as the timer ended. There were a lot of horrible things running through my mind, and I just prayed to God to save me. I have my whole life ahead of me. It shouldn't end here, dying so soon, at least not in this creepy old house, I said to myself. I didn't know what to do. I anxiously paced back and forth in the room until I heard a dragging sound near the door. It opened with a creak and the masked man entered. He had an axe in his hand. I ran far from him, as far as I possibly could. I got cornered. He came near me, with an eccentric snicker, elevating the axe, while we heard the sirens wailing from outdoors. The beams of flashing red and blue indicated it was the police. The guy retreated and ran from the room. Open up! Police! I heard them shout. The sound of the door breaking down echoed through the house. They rushed in to rescue me. I wasn't hurt. However, the incident left me traumatized. It turned out that someone had seen my flashlight and heard me yelling for help. They didn't come to help me themselves, but they called the police. Thank God the police arrived. Otherwise... I would have died in the most horrible way imaginable. I still get goosebumps when I think about that day. The man had fled into the woods as soon as he saw the police. And I saw two policemen chasing him. One of them had asked me if I could describe his appearance. But I told them he was wearing a mask. I told them the whole story. And when I left from there, 
I waited as they searched the entire house. The other officers returned, with the masked man apprehended. I was glad they caught him. After they unmasked him, he turned out to be the same older man who had opened the door for me. Gray, greasy hair, wrinkles on his skin, dark skin tone, front teeth broken. He was wearing an old, long overcoat with dirty blue jeans and black snow boots. It turned out he was mentally ill and had escaped from the mental asylum a few months back. I wasn't the first who had encountered him, but fortunately, I was the first to escape him. According to him, <laughs> the only reason he did this was because he liked the look of fear on the faces of people he used to kill. I quit my job the next day, and I never worked delivery again. I'm pretty sure that if you ask someone the question, what's the happiest place in the world? They'll all answer your question with one word, Disneyland. But I'm one of those few people who always had a different answer, as there was a time in my life when the happiest place in the world to me was a particular subway restaurant down the block. Now I'm sure you're wondering what kind of crazy person would say a chain restaurant is the happiest place in the world. But after telling you my experience, you'll understand the messed up reason as to why it was my happy place. It happened when I was in my final year of college. At the time, I was going through a very rough patch and I eventually became seriously depressed. I was walking home from school one day when I wanted to stop and grab something to eat. I looked up close restaurants on my phone and the nearest place was the Subway restaurant down the block. So I decided to go there. There was nothing special about this particular joint as I had been to a Subway restaurant before, but when I walked in, I felt an eerie calmness as my head went light and for the first time in years, I felt relaxed. As I sat down and ordered, I realized that I wasn't the only one experiencing this euphoric feeling as everyone else, from the waitress to the customers and even the kids, were all oddly calm and they had smiles plastered across all their faces. The place felt like home and after I was done eating, I sat there and ordered a few more drinks just so I wouldn't have to leave so soon and that was the first of the many calm evenings that I was going to have in the following months. After that day, going to that subway joint became second nature to me as I ate all the meals there, be it breakfast, lunch or dinner. And I didn't care if it was a monotone diet or if it wasn't that healthy. I just wanted to go there. Soon enough, my friends Marvin, Sean and Emily all became curious as to why I was incessantly going to a particular Subway restaurant and I remember saying to them, look, I really don't know how to explain it to you guys, but there's just something about that place that's really calming. It's like home. I remember Emily laughed at the statement as she said, really? A Subway joint? It's great, but it's not that great. I knew they weren't going to believe me, so I looked at them and said, how about we all go after class today? I'm sure you'll see what I'm talking about. Surely enough, after classes that day, we went to the joint and within minutes, they all had smiles on their faces. After we finished eating, I remember saying to them, you see, I told you that it was just one of those places with good vibes. I watched as they all nodded their heads in agreement to my statement. And after that, we had a very fun evening at the restaurant as we just stayed there ordering drinks and talking. Everything was fine and perfect till the 21st of February, 2019. That day marked the beginning of the strange events that were going to happen in the following weeks. We were at our normal Subway restaurant that day when something very morbid happened. A 12-year-old kid who was sitting with his family at the table next to us became very silent as he quietly got up and walked to a window. Now, his odd behavior had gathered our attention as well as the attention of his family. I heard his mother call out to him, but instead of running back into his mother's arms, I watched as the kid slammed his head into the window in front of him. It cracked and there was a small cut on his face, but just like before, with no hesitation, the kid slammed his head into the window again and again, all while having a smile on his face. Screams erupted from around the restaurant as the boy's parents rushed to get him to stop. They pulled at him, but he forcefully continued to repeatedly smash his head into that window. To be honest, the worst thing about that morbid moment wasn't the horrific scene that I had just witnessed. No, the worst thing was that as I calmly watched the glass shards puncture and cut the 12-year-old boy's face, 
I felt nothing but happiness. The parents of the child eventually forced their boy away from the window and the police were called. Due to all the commotion, I and my friends decided to leave as we were all stunned at what had just happened. The very next day saw the continuation of the strange occurrences as Emily had fallen down convulsing during her first class of the day. So Marvin and Sean had to take her to the hospital. I received a text from Sean after class that day saying, Emily has been admitted and she's being checked. Apparently, Marvin's sick too as he recently started throwing up and I don't feel too good either. I think it's a bug or something. We really need you here, man. Make sure you come by after classes. Now, these people were literally my best friends in the world as I had known Emily since we were kids and I went to high school with Marvin and Sean. They were like blood brothers to me. But after school that day, I found myself cycling to my subway joint instead of the hospital. I knew it was the most messed up thing I had done in my life as my best friends were all lying sick in the hospital. But I felt like my body willed itself there. It told me that it needed to be there and I told myself that once I entered those doors, everything would be all right. That day marked the beginning of a very messy time in my life as I started incessantly going to that particular subway joint. I purposely missed school, classes, and events as all I wanted to do was be at the subway joint down the block. Sometimes I wouldn't even eat. I would just order a drink and sit there mindlessly for hours. Things got worse from there and after a month on one fateful afternoon, I realized that my incessant habit of going there, eating there, and spending all my time there had become a problem. So I went to the same people I abandoned for help, my friends. I fully expected them to turn me away, but they welcomed me with open arms. I pretty much moved in with them as they kept me under supervision. It was odd because I thought I was the only weirdo in the world who was incessantly addicted to going to a restaurant. Things went by well during the first week, but by the beginning of the second week, I couldn't take it anymore. I tried to sneak out of the house. I told lies and I came up with all sorts of excuses to leave, but my friends always saw through my bullshit. It got really bad at one point and I screamed at Emily. I will never forget the hurt look in her eyes as she said, What's wrong with you, Will? This isn't you. I immediately started saying, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, Emily. I don't know what came over me. And that's when she said a statement that made a horrific realization flush through my mind as she looked at me and said, This is a bit out of place, but you're really acting like my cousin Miles during the weeks leading up to his rehab. He was upstanding and I can swear that he lashed out the exact same way you lashed out at me. When she was done, I looked at all my friends and I said the words, Guys, would you go with me to the hospital? I need to take a drug test. Perplexed, they all looked at me like I was crazy, but they all agreed. And after the test, a horrific revelation was revealed, as the doctor said that the traces of over 15 drugs were found in my system, and he couldn't identify what most of them were. He said some of them showed similar traits to drugs like Oxycontin, LSD, and ecstasy. But the chemical structure was a bit different. He also said other traces of drugs similar to opiates and hallucinogens were found but he couldn't tell as they too possessed a slightly different chemical structure. He then said that these were the only ones he could identify as he didn't know what the rest of them were. We all had shocked looks on our faces as it was clear now that my body was going through withdrawal. But that wasn't what shocked us, no. What really shocked us was that I had never taken any hard drugs in my life, no matter how sad or depressed I was. So there was no explanation as to why there were drugs in my system. It didn't take long to put two and two together, as in that split second, everything was suddenly clear. After leaving the hospital, we all went to the police station, and I told the cops everything that happened and what I suspected was the cause. An investigation was carried out, and it was revealed that an unknown gas-like drug was being pumped and pushed through the vents of that particular Subway restaurant. As the investigations went on, it was revealed on the news the drug was not FDA approved, as they had no knowledge of the concocted drug. It was also shown on the news that all of the employees, including the manager, were taken for questioning as the police started to get to the bottom of the ghastly act. The case became extremely huge as lawsuits were filed and everyone wanted to sue. I was advised to sue, but I didn't. My mind couldn't take any more stress 
and I just wanted to leave the whole thing behind. It's been two years now since the incident. The ordeal instantly made me a struggling addict and I had to go to rehab. It was painful, but I got through it. After that, I went to therapy and for the sake of my mental health, I swore to never go to any Subway restaurant again. I've avoided their restaurants for two years now, but sometimes, sometimes, I feel the incessant urge to run into one of their restaurants and see if I would get the same euphoric feeling that I felt on that fateful first day. Don't get me wrong, I already know I wouldn't, as it was revealed that the incident was only carried out by that particular joint. But even then, I still fight that urge every day. And the sad part about it is that I know I'll be fighting this urge for the rest of my life. The strange phenomenon hit our town like an epidemic. It originally started with a girl named Valerie Maverick, as she was one of the first children who started sleepwalking in our little town. Then it moved on to Ezekiel Jameson, and it didn't take long before every single one of the kids in my grade started sleepwalking. I was 13 at the time, and I was in the eighth grade, and I remember that when the numerous reports of mass sleepwalking started to occur, it perplexed all the doctors, psychologists, and scientists in our town. The strange occurrence baffled all of them, as somnambulism, widely known as sleepwalking, wasn't a contagious activity. Things were fine at first, as most specialists calmed troubled parents by telling them that everything was going to be fine. But it didn't take long before a mass panic started to happen in our town, as some of the children who left their homes while sleepwalking never came back the next morning. Troubled parents started locking their children's doors at night, but that just made things worse because in an attempt to get out of the room while sleepwalking, most children viciously banged their heads against the door until someone opened it. And some even went as far as jumping out of their high windows to their deaths. The horrific news started making headlines as doctors and specialists had never seen sleepwalking cases as peculiar as these. Strangely, the sleepwalking epidemic only affected children who were aged between 12 and 13, so it was mainly children in the eighth grade. Since locking them up was a bad option, efforts were made to follow these children in order to see where they were going. And after trailing them, they realized that after leaving their respective houses, all the children gathered in a secluded area behind the town school and waited patiently until they woke up the next morning. Now, I was one of the few kids in the eighth grade who wasn't affected by the strange sleepwalking phenomenon. And at the time, I guessed it was because I didn't really sleep much at night. I usually spent most of my nights playing video games or watching anime, and I always went to bed early in the morning rather than at night. But one night, while I was gaming, I felt myself dozing off as I was extremely sleepy. I found it really odd, as my body had gotten accustomed to staying up all night. I tried to shake off the sleep, but I couldn't. And the last thing I remember that night was closing my eyes for a second before I woke up the next morning at the back of my school, surrounded by my classmates. My father had come to get me as I had apparently dozed off and started sleepwalking. I was scared now, as the strange sleepwalking phenomenon had finally gotten to me, but I was determined not to do it again. So that night, I snuck into the kitchen and drank a lot of extra caffeinated coffee. After doing that, I felt more awake than ever before. But after a couple of hours, I felt my eyes shutting themselves, just like the night before. I tried to fight it again, but it felt like I was being forced to sleep by an unseen force. I continued to fight the urge to sleep till I eventually felt myself entering a trance-like state. It's hard to put into words, but it was almost like I was asleep and awake at the same time. I felt my body move on its own, and no matter how much I tried to stop it, I couldn't, as it truly felt like my body had a mind of its own. I saw myself walk out of the house and down the street to school. The scene terrified me as I watched my classmates leave their houses and walk like they were being pulled by invisible strings towards the school. From what I can remember, it looked like a really messed up class activity. Like last night, we all finally gathered at the back of our school. We waited there motionless for a while, till I saw someone emerge from the bushes. His name was Francis Harrison, and he was our 8th grade English teacher. Now, 
I could never really remember what happened in Mr. Harrison's class, as I always zoned out for some reason, but I felt like he was one of my favorite teachers, as his classes always made me feel calm. Confused as to what he was doing there, I watched him bring out a phone as he said, They weren't followed tonight. Bring over the van immediately. A black van then rolled out almost immediately, and I saw a very shady man walk out of it. Mr. Francis then said, Stand still, children. And even though everyone was asleep, their bodies all obeyed. He and the strange man started to look through the children as the man said, I only want the best quality. This one looks like she will fetch a fine price. He then pointed to one of my classmates, Ruby Pierce. Mr. Francis then looked at her and said, Now, be a good girl, Ruby, and hop in the van. I watched in horror as Ruby, who was still sleeping, obeyed his words and walked into the van. One by one, I watched as they picked off my classmates before they finally reached me. I stood motionless as I heard the man say, What's wrong with this one? His eyes are half open. He doesn't look like he's fully under your control like the others. Mr. Francis then said, He is. I'll show you. Leonardo Scott, I want you to go into that van right this second. As he spoke, my body began to move towards the van. Scared now, I started to strongly fight whatever was controlling me. It took a lot of strength, but after a while, I managed to regain a little control so I let out a gut-wrenching scream. My scream sent the other kids into a frenzy as they all started to act up. Shocked, Mr. Francis rushed towards me as he tried to silence my screams, but I instinctively knew what to do when defending myself from people much bigger than me. So, I went for his eyes by thrusting a couple of my fingers into them. He screamed, and he finally let go of me, and so I started to run. The loud noise of frantic children had alerted a nearby security guard, and the cops were called immediately. The next day, I was called in by some of the police officers, as I was the only kid who regained some form of consciousness through everything that happened that night. I then told them everything that I saw, and an investigation was carried out into Mr. Francis's life. It didn't take long before it was revealed that the man called Mr. Francis Harrison never existed. He was using a fake identity, and his real name was Dmitry Oslo. He was a hardened Russian criminal who was wanted in over 40 states. He was also a notorious child trafficker and kidnapper who used forms of advanced hypnosis in addition to scopolamine, widely known as devil's breath, to kidnap his victims easily and willingly. Eventually, traces of the drug were found in our system, and after a while, the memory of what actually happened during his supposed English classes started coming back to us as we recalled how he hypnotized and instructed each and every one of us to walk to the back of the school every night while we were sleeping. The case baffled the detectives and an explanation for the mass sleepwalking phenomenon was finally given. A manhunt was set out to find Mr. Francis Harrison, but unfortunately, he hasn't been found till this very day. How's it going? My name is Anthony, and I'm a single dad. It's been extremely difficult raising my girl alone in New York City, but luckily, Liz has been the most wonderful daughter on all the planet. Together, we have overcome anything life has thrown at us, up until today. I fear what has transpired last month is something insurmountable for us. You see, young Liz was simply wonderful. Her problems and difficulties were things I could handle with ease, they rarely exceeded cuts, scrapes, or stomach aches. You know, those were easy. A few band-aids, hugs, and kisses here and there, and suddenly I was Superman to her. There was nothing I couldn't fix in her eyes. But as Liz grew, so did the magnitude of her problems and complaints. Gone was the little girl that played with dolls and kitchen sets. She was quickly replaced by a moody teenager filled with angst and rebellion. This Liz was more difficult to handle. You just don't get it, Dad. She'd scream at me often. It was the usual finale and finishing touch to our arguments. Maybe she was right. What could I, a 42-year-old man, have in common with a 15-year-old girl? Her world revolved around boys, social media, and Starbucks. And mine just didn't. Things took a turn for the worse six months ago. I felt Liz more emotionally detached from me than ever. 
always deeply distracted by a phone and social media applications, they were alien to me. I barely understood how Facebook was used, so to me, Instagram, TikToks, Twitters, and Snapchat, it was just a different language. At the time, a wave of child abductions was sweeping through New York City. In four months, 19 kids and teenagers had vanished. None of them was found. Investigators suspected these kidnappings were occurring through social media targeting. An ongoing theory by investigators was that children and teenagers were being followed and tracked by this group of criminals. After learning the kids' location, habits, and activities, the criminals, usually working alone, swooped them away. The motive behind the kidnappings was still unknown, but a pattern had been identified. Young kids were being followed before being abducted. Reports warning children and parents about oversharing of personal information on social media frequented the news. I pleaded with Liz not to use any of these services, but she called me basic and argued every single one of her friends still used it. She didn't want to be the only weirdo that didn't, so we compromised. I allowed her to use them only if she allowed me to monitor all her posts. She accepted my agreement, saying lots of people followed her and I'd just be another one on that list. Every night before going to bed, I'd sit with my reading glasses and view her Snapchat stories. They consisted of uh, typical teenager activities. Dancing routines with her friends, drinks at Starbucks, the occasional boy. I rarely asked questions and she rarely commented on my constant vigilance. The reports of missing children only intensified my watch and devotion to looking after my daughter. The night it occurred was like every other. It was a Friday evening and Liz had gone to a friend Trisha's house for a get together with friends. Despite Trisha's parents being present, we kept in close communication. I still worried any time Liz was out of the house after sundown. So I watched some television, keep myself from wondering about potential dangers that could be approaching her. After what seemed like an eternity, Liz arrived home at 11.15 p.m. She greeted me, said goodnight, and headed to her room. I headed for mine, ready for a good night's sleep. As was my daily ritual, I sat on my bed, put on my reading glasses, and began watching Liz's Snapchat stories. There were over 50, starting out with a day at school. I watched my daughter's day play out through Snapchat, all while she slept in a room across the hall. Her stories began with videos of her and Trisha walking through the school's busy hallway, headed towards homeroom class. They complained and joked about Mrs. Weber, and they wanted the school day to be over in anticipation of the party. The next few stories were of Liz walking through a crowded parking lot towards her car, again talking about Trisha's party, inviting her followers to attend. After those, a series of stories showed Trisha and Liz at an overcrowded Starbucks, drinking frosty caffeinated beverages and raving about the party. Finally, the last series of stories detailed the anticipation of the party. The activities shown were mostly innocent enough for my approval. No drugs were involved, no alcohol either, and it certainly seemed like no boys were being too overly friendly. Trisha's parents even made an appearance in her Snapchat stories, putting my mind further at ease. At least there was adult supervision. The Snapchat stories ended with her exiting her car and arriving home. She thanked Trisha via her story for a great party and headed for the front door, only seconds before entering and greeting me in real life. However, something lingered in my mind. Did I just imagine it? I put on my reading glasses again, picked up my phone, and began re-watching her stories. My heart sank. As the screen flashed before my eyes, I began taking continuous screenshots throughout her stories. Adrenaline pumping, before I knew it, I had gotten up and was now pacing through the room staring intently at her stories. I hurried to look at the screenshots I had taken, my heart beating fast. My hands began to shake. As I zoomed in to each screenshot, my worst fear became a reality. During her morning Snapchat stories, a screenshot revealed a man in the background, staring at Liz from within the crowd. He wore a plaid shirt, jeans, thick glasses. He looked in his late 30s, trying to appear younger to blend into the school setting. Her videos showed him sneaking around the background, trying to shield his face, occasionally being captured by my screenshots. At Starbucks, the same man sat at a table behind them, hiding behind a newspaper, shooting quick momentary glances at them, again, captured by my screenshots. At Trisha's party, the same man was cowering in the living room corner, alone, this time wearing a hood over his head. He continuously covered his face with his phone, but again, my screenshots captured his true identity. My panic culminated when I spotted him in Liz's final Snapchat story. 
He hid behind a tree in my backyard as Liz exited her car. The moonlight hit his glasses, shining brightly momentarily, seized by my screenshot. He sneaked behind a tree, heading towards my backyard where Liz's window was. I dropped my phone and sprinted to Liz's room. I bursted through the door and found myself in an image I will never forget. The dark room was illuminated by an open window. The figure of the man in the plaid shirt turned to look at me, as half of his body was out the window escaping. Over his shoulder, the limp body of my daughter dangled lifelessly. For a moment, our eyes met, and the moonlight familiarly glistened off his glasses. I charged at him, but he was out the window when I reached him. I threw my body forward through the open window, diving face first and landing in my backyard. I looked up and saw him escaping. He moved gracefully and nimbly through my dark backyard as a fox moves to avoid detection. Our pursuit lasted a quarter of a mile before he realized he couldn't outrun me with my daughter's body weighing him down. As I grabbed his plaid shirt, having caught up with him, he threw my daughter's limp body onto the street and accelerated into the darkness. Her body hit the concrete hard, ricocheting like a rag doll. I rushed to my daughter's rescue, checking for a pulse, any sign of the life. The next three days were spent in the hospital room conversations with doctors and detectives. The good news was that Liz was alive. She had been given a strong sedative, but besides its after effects and a broken wrist from the fall, she would be fine. The bad news was that this man in the plaid shirt had escaped undetected. Investigators and other forms of law enforcement have interviewed me relentlessly, but no arrests have been made. Liz continues to be tormented by the idea that this man is roaming free. When we arrived home, the first thing she did was delete her Snapchat account. However, she still lives in constant fear and paranoia. She doesn't want to leave the house without me, and has fallen into a terrible depression. I'll confront her just as I did when she was a young child. But let this be a warning to all the parents on the dangers of Snapchat and how easily our children can be targeted. Most kids get excited at the possibility of a night alone without parent supervision. Usually that means staying up late, watching scary movies, and eating junk food. That's what I envisioned that night in October as I pleaded and negotiated with my parents. I'm 11 years old now. I said as if I were a mature adult. I don't need a babysitter. Please? My parents were going out of town for a work-related night out. And after a lot of pleading, begging, and immature whining, they budged and allowed me to stay home alone. It's only one night. My dad whispered to my worried mom in a consoling tone. He'll be all right. I ran to my room excited for the upcoming night of unsupervised fun. It wouldn't take long for that excitement to morph into panic and terror, as it became the worst night of my life. Before long, my mom was kissing me goodbye and smiling worriedly. You call us if you need anything, anything at all. Got it? Yes, mom. I rolled my eyes. I placed my glass of water on the coffee table in the living room and let my mom embrace me. We finished our goodbyes and before long, the door closed. I was alone, unsupervised for the first time in my life. Fear began to creep into the pit of my stomach. What if something bad actually happened? Who would I call? What would I do? I heard my parents' car pull out of the driveway and the tingling fear became stronger, flooding into my head. I ran upstairs to my bedroom that gave me a clear view to the front of the house. My parents were still in the driveway, pulling out. I watched them, forehead against the glass, as rain began to fall on the window, obscuring my view of the car driving away. The car grew distant, smaller and smaller. They turned left at the end of our street. They were gone. I stayed frozen, face against the glass. I regretted asking to stay alone. What if there was an emergency? What if I burnt down the house? My eyes became heavy with tears. I continued to stare out the window for minutes, hoping their car would reappear, turning into our street and into our driveway, where they'd tell me their event was canceled and they'd stay home with me. The light post on the corner of the street flickered on, breaking me out of my daze. It was getting dark. Okay, I whispered to myself. If I don't do anything stupid, I'll be fine. I began to move away from the window when something caused me to turn back. Under the light post, two figures turned the corner and walked toward my end of the street. They wore black sweaters and pants and looked paranoid. One person looked around constantly while the other hit his arm and gestured to keep looking forward. 
I stared as the panic began to set in again. Were they coming here? No way. That'd be ridiculous, right? The figures passed the first house on the street. They passed the second one. They passed the third. My house was next. Keep walking, I whispered in a trembling voice. But they didn't keep walking. The pair of men stopped in front of my house as one gestured at the empty driveway. They argued. The rain began to come down harder. They approached my front door. I could hear my heart beating in my chest now. I let out a small yelp as the doorbell rang. What did they want? Why were they here? I came down the stairs quietly and stood over the welcome mat by the entrance. I stared at the door as the door chimed again. I pressed my ear close to the cold wooden door. I could hear them now. You see, one said, there's no one here. I saw them carrying luggage into their car and saw them drive off. They're not coming back for the night. I don't know, man, said the other, tone oozing with paranoia. Shut up, the other one said. The door handle began to jiggle violently. I pressed my hands close to my mouth to suppress a scream. Fuck it, the paranoid one said. Let's go through the window and get off the street. Everyone can see us. Before I had time to react, the window next to the door exploded, causing shards of glass to rain onto the hardwood floor. Without time to think, I sprinted upstairs. This cannot be happening, I repeated to myself as I glided up the stairs as quietly as possible. I glanced back down the stairs as I turned into my parents' bedroom. A body emerged from the shattered window, causing my stomach to drop. I shut the door and rushed under the bed. Had they seen me? Did they hear the door clicking shut? Did they know I was here? I laid on my stomach, my mind assuming the worst. From my hiding spot, I stared at the small slit of light under the door. Glass shattering broke out from downstairs. The scratching of furniture being dragged across the floor followed. And finally, voices broke out. Someone's here, said a calm but firm voice. What? How do you know? Said another. Fear surrounding every word. This water, it's cold. There's still ice in it. Under the bed, I broke out in cold sweat after hearing these words. I focused to hear anything else, but nothing followed. The silence was deafening. Minutes passed of complete silence that felt like an eternity. Suddenly, the soft, subtle cracking of the wooden floor creaked. The soft click of a door being shut quietly followed. They were in my room. I stared at the slit of light under the door. The creaking continued, crescendoing and nearing. My panic grew. My fear became a reality. Two dark spots suddenly appeared under the door, blocking the bright strip of light coming from outside of my parents' room. They were here. The door opened slowly. I could now see two pairs of feet under the threshold. I know you're here, said a calm voice. It sounded taunting and playful. You can come out. We won't hurt you, the other voice snickered. Unmoving, I stared as the two men separated. They went around the perimeter of the bed, and I quickly lost sight of one. The other stood directly in front of me. I could have reached out and grabbed his shoelace. I wonder where he is, said the one in front of me. Is he in the closet, behind the curtains? Or perhaps he may be under the bed. As he said the last word, a pair of hands grabbed my ankles and began pulling me. I shrieked in terror, but an enormous hand covered my mouth. I struggled, kicked, and flailed to no avail. Two enormous arms engulfed me, leaving me immobile. The man that had stood in front of me approached. Sleep, he whispered. He brought a moist cloth and placed it over my mouth and nose. Everything began to go dark. Seconds later, I lost consciousness. I woke up in a dark and damp room. I laid on cold cement over a thin blanket. My body ached. My mouth was incredibly dry. I sat up groggy and my eyes adjusted to the dim light. A single light bulb hung from a wire in the middle of the room that was void of any windows or decorations. I scanned the perimeter, trying to orient myself with no success. In the corner of the room, a flight of stairs led up. Minutes passed when a loud pop rang from above. Muffled screaming broke out and banging and crashing followed. I recoiled and curled up on the ground, covering the back of my head with my hands. 
The scuffle overhead intensified as a series of loud pops continued. Then, complete and total silence. A minute passed, and the silence was broken. The loud creak of a heavy door being opened echoed through the damp room. I shut my eyes tight, ready for more pain. Mike, came a strong voice. Mike, are you in here? I remained silent. This is Police Officer Gordon. I am here to help. I looked up, gave out a cry of acknowledgement, and felt hope for the first time in days. Tears flowed from my mom's eyes as she hugged me tightly after being reunited at the police station. For what seemed like an eternity, my parents both embraced me in the detective's office. I could have stayed in their embrace forever. Finally, Officer Gordon explained that the pair of burglars had been watching my house for days. They noticed my parents left with luggage, and they assumed they would be gone for an extended period of time. As soon as they drove off, they pounced at the opportunity of an empty house ready for looting. But as they discovered I was there, they were unsure what to do. I was a hiccup in their plan. They drugged me and placed me in the basement of their house. However, as they carried my unconscious body and placed it in the back of their truck that was hidden around the corner of our street, a camera atop the light post caught their license plate. The very next day, my parents arrived and before minutes, my house was full of detectives and police officers. After some digging, the lamppost camera footage was used to locate my kidnappers. Decades have passed since that horrible day, and I am eternally thankful that the camera was placed on that lamppost. I sometimes think of what horrible fate would have followed if that footage hadn't been discovered. Snapchat is one of the most popular apps amongst teens and young adults. It's a way to share your day with your friends, send each other pictures, and play with filters. I used it a lot through high school, and now I'm in college, it's helped me connect with new people. I'm Daphne, and this is why I don't use Snapchat anymore. It wasn't unusual for me to get friend requests after classes started in the new semester, and some of them I accepted, others I didn't. There was always a mix of bots that would add me as well. They'd always friend me and send me some sort of message to check out their sexy content. Those I blocked and reported. Due to the high cost of tuition and losing my job, I had to drop out of school and look for another job. It was really difficult to find one that I could make enough money to pay tuition and I was feeling completely hopeless. I walked out of an interview for a fast food place and checked my phone. I saw that someone added me on Snapchat and checked it out. It was a guy named Logan and his bitmoji seemed kind of cute. He sent me a picture of himself with the caption, hey. His picture was very attractive and I decided to accept him as a friend. I took a cute selfie and sent it to him with the caption, hi. We began messaging back and forth. Hi there, I'm Logan. Hi Logan, I'm Daphne. You live in Atlanta too? Yes I do. Are you attending university? I was. Why not anymore? I lost my job and couldn't pay for tuition. Sorry to hear about that. It's okay, do you go? Yeah, and I happen to be the richest guy on campus. That must be nice. We continued to chat late into the night. I began to feel an attraction to him as he was hilarious and good looking to boot. I wondered if he needed to be up for school the next day, but he insisted it was fine. We talked consistently over the next couple of days when Logan offered me something that should have been a red flag. But when that stupid fast food place declined my application, I was desperate. You want to work for me? What would I be doing? I think you're really attractive and would like you to make content just for me. What would that entail? You make videos and take pictures based on what I want. I have a lot of money and can pay for you to come back to school. I had an odd feeling about where this was going, but when you're desperate, you'll do what you have to do. How much? $3,500 a week. Just making content for you? Yes. Do you use PayPal? I do. Send me your PayPal. I sent him my PayPal information and to my surprise, he sent me $3,500. To be honest, I've dabbled in sugar baby stuff before, but never went through with it because they always ask for money up front. Logan just gave it to me. This week, I want pictures of just your feet. I want 10 pictures and we'll pay extra if you feel like sending extra. He described to me the different kinds of foot pictures to send him. 
He wanted my feet to be covered in something edible from dripping with honey to smothered in cake with frosting and a pot of chili. I did everything he asked and extra just to see if he would pay extra. To my surprise, he did. The content escalated to more risque things, but I was getting so comfortable with it as he paid up. Within a month, I was caught up with my bills and able to come back to school. It was nice being able to attend classes and take the weekends to create the content he asked for and I sent it to him. There was one week he didn't send payment and it was after I sent him his requested videos. One day, I saw a guy on campus and thought he looked familiar. I ran up to him. Logan? He gave me a strange look, asking who I was. It's me, Daphne. I don't know a Daphne. What? I've been sending you content for weeks now and I wanted to say you're late on payment. I have no idea what you're talking about. He walked away leaving me confused and a part of me felt violated. I have shown this guy everything for the money and he acted like he had no idea who I was in public? I suppose I understood. Maybe this was a dirty secret for him. God knows it was for me. I went to my American literature class and sat down. The professor insisted we call him Doug. A lot of professors insisted we call them by their first names. I noticed Doug kept glancing at me through the lecture. He was an older man and I picked up on the fact he was looking at a lot of girls. After class, I got a notification from PayPal that I received my money for the week. Logan and I continued our agreement and I never saw him around campus again. I wondered if he just wanted to avoid me and I honestly didn't care at this point. He paid me and I sent the pictures and videos he asked for. I had Doug's class every other day and I met a guy in there that I actually liked. His name was Greg and we sat together in class every day we had it. One day, Greg asked me out to lunch and I accepted. Greg and I began hanging out a lot and started dating. He didn't know about my agreement with Logan on Snapchat and I was hoping he wouldn't find out. One day after class, Greg gave me a kiss as we wouldn't see each other until after lunch. Doug had pulled me aside and asked me to stay after to talk to him. I figured it was about my grade as spending time with Greg has pushed my studies to the side. With juggling my secret hustle and Greg, the last thing on my mind has been American literature. Thanks for meeting me, Daphne. Sure thing. You know I care about the well-being of my students, right? Yes, I do. I wanted to talk about the test on Friday. You flunked it. I cringed and ran a hand awkwardly through my hair as I sat down in the seat next to him. Yeah, I figured I did. Well, the good news is I can help you. He reached over and placed a hand on my thigh and rubbed his thumb against my knee. I do this for a lot of my students. I pushed his hand away and stood up. I don't think so, pig. I'm going to report you for sexual harassment. You're not going to do that. He chuckled. His demeanor was smug and arrogant. Oh, really? And why not? Because I am Logan. With that, he pulled out his phone and opened up all the content I sent to Logan in exchange for thousands of dollars a week. I felt the color drain from my face and he began laughing maniacally as he scrolled through all the explicit photos I sent him. You dumb bitch, it's been me the whole time. But Logan's a real guy on campus. No, he's not. I was just using a picture of some random kid. You sick bastard. He continued laughing hysterically and even snorted. Sick am I? You're the one who agreed to send content from my eyes only for money. I paid your way back into this college and if you don't want me releasing your photos, you're gonna do exactly as I say. I scoffed. You're not gonna release my photos because if you're caught prostituting students, you'll lose your job and be placed on the sex offenders list. You'll never see a student again. <laughs> oh honey. All I have to do is show your pictures and say that you sent them to me in hopes to get your grades up. They'll never believe a student over me. I raised my hand and slapped him hard across the face. You know what? You can expose me. That's fine. If that's what it takes to be free of our deal, then so be it. I grabbed my books and stormed out of the classroom in tears. I tried to go about my day as usual, but I felt paranoid and found myself looking over my shoulder. The dean of the university called me and asked me to come into the office. This was it for me. I went in to face my fate, but instead I saw Greg there, showing footage of mine and Doug's conversation from earlier. 
Doug was arrested for paying sugar babies that he would friend on Snapchat using random pictures of guys around campus to gain their trust. It caused a big mess with everyone involved and a lot of young boys had to appear in court to clear their names. Because Doug did this to a number of girls, none of us were expelled. If it hadn't been for Greg having an odd feeling about me being asked to stay after class, he wouldn't have gotten the footage and exposed him. He was a hero to many. Ladies, next time you get friended on Snapchat from a guy who seems trustworthy, don't engage. It's not worth it. It has been 10 years, but the memories of this occurrence remain fresh. In the first year of college, I had a roommate whose name was Jack. He was on a scholarship. He was brilliant, but extremely shy. He hardly talks. Whenever I tried to talk to him, he never spoke up. After a few weeks together, we got to know each other better. He told me a single mom raised him. She later died of a drug overdose when he was 12. He was adopted by an older man who had just lost his family to an accident, and he told me all the man ever did was stare at cars and fix them all day. The man died a few weeks before he came to college. He loved planting, but most of his crops died before they even matured. He always seems to think he is full of bad luck. He was severely bullied in high school and was often called names. Unfortunately, Damon, who attended the same high school with him and was one of his bullies, was also in college with us and also stayed in the same dorm. Damon had a roommate too, Fred. They were typical bad boys. Jack tried his best to avoid Damon, but he couldn't. When Damon found out Jack was in college with him, he started spreading rumors about how his mother died and how poor he was in high school. People started calling him names and teasing him. It was high school all over again for him. He would wake up early to take his bath to avoid coming across anyone. Of course, I would intervene from time to time and threaten to file a complaint if they didn't stop. One time, Jack was in the bathroom when Damon and Fred decided to tease him. They took his towels and clothes and told him to walk back naked to his room. I had to call the dorm supervisor who came to his rescue. Damon and Fred had gone out to party with their girlfriends one night. Unfortunately, on their way back, they had an accident and no one survived. It was a very tragic incident. The police started investigating the accident. They realized someone had tampered with the car's brakes. It was later discovered that Fred fought with Mike at the party. Mike was a senior. He was very popular and well known for his naughty behaviors. The police arrested Mike for questioning and the school expelled him immediately because he was already on probation. Everyone had forgotten what happened and we moved on. Up until one night, I woke up suddenly and everywhere was dark. It came as a shock to me because Jack never sleeps with the light off. I called out his name but there was no response. I stood up to get the light when I had a spine tingling feeling as if someone was behind me. I immediately switched on the light and to my surprise, he was sitting at the edge of his bed. Were you just behind me, Jack? I asked. No, he answered coldly. Why aren't you sleeping and why was the light off? He didn't respond. Instead, he laid down and slept. I was a little scared. He mumbled some words, but I couldn't hear him, so I decided to go back to sleep. I closed my eyes for two seconds and Jack switched off the lights again. I quickly switched it back on and told him I needed the light. That night, I didn't sleep much, so I decided to write a complaint letter to the school the following day. I wrote about how I thought he needed help. That was the first time he acted weird. I would often catch him talking to himself, hiding things, and one time I saw him cackling. His face was pale as if he hadn't eaten or drank. After I wrote the letter, I decided to return to the dorm early to go through his stuff. I skipped my last class and headed to the dorm. Luckily for me, Jack wasn't at the dorm yet. I started going through his stuff. Then I saw a chronicle and decided to go through it. I stood there frozen, going through the horrible things written in Jack's chronicle. He wrote about how he plotted Mike and Fred's fight. He had sent a threatening message to Mike pretending to be Fred. Mike went to confront Fred at the party and that was how the fight started. He also wrote about how he tampered with the brakes of Fred's car, knowing fully well that Damon would be in the car too. I was engrossed in what I was reading and didn't hear Jack come in. 
I felt someone behind me, so I turned around. My heart skipped a beat when I realized Jack was behind me. Before I could say anything, he hit me with an iron and I passed out. When I regained consciousness, I couldn't see much. It was dark and my hands were tied. Jack had locked me in the trunk of his car. I was shouting for help and struggling. It was getting hard to breathe. I kept asking myself why Jack would do such a thing. It was getting harder and harder to breathe. I kept banging on the car, hoping that someone would hear me. Jack had asked the dorm security for a shovel. He gave it to him, but he was suspicious. When Jack got to his car, he opened his trunk, and before I could scream or say anything further, he hit me in the head with the shovel, closed the trunk, and drove off. Thankfully, security had followed Jack quietly, and he saw everything. He reported what he saw to the police. The police alerted every officer on patrol and they tracked Jack's car. They found the car empty and began to search for me and Jack in the surrounding environment when one officer raised a notice that he had found two of my lost bloody teeth in the trunk and they needed to act fast. They screamed and searched the vicinity where he was caught trying to bury me. They searched his late adopted father's garden and by the time they found me, I was half buried by Jack who was laughing during the whole incident. I was rushed to the hospital and he was arrested. Jack was sentenced to life imprisonment. He started his sentence in a mental health facility and was transferred to prison after his treatment was complete. I also saw a therapist for a while because I couldn't get over the fact that Jack had tried to bury me alive. My therapist told me I needed to talk to Jack. So I visited him at the mental asylum. He didn't answer any of my questions. Instead, he was smiling like a maniac and repeatedly said, You had to go. When I returned to college, Jack had gotten numerous nicknames. Jack the Psycho Killer, Jack the Human Planter, Jack the Horror Fetish, and Jack the Roommate Who Lost It. These were the few I heard of. These names reminded me of the incident all over again and I had to ask to leave the room we both stayed in. During school, people would cluster around me, hoping to hear what I had to say. I dismissed them and told them the rumors and names they called him were what messed with him in the first place. I repeatedly visited the therapist for a while because I couldn't get over the fact that Jack had tried to bury me alive and I could have been the manure for his garden because he loved to plant and couldn't see another of his newly planted crops die, so I had to go. My first roommate experience happened in college. I had never lived with anyone before as I was an only child, so I was really excited to see how living with someone else was going to be. My father owned a large apartment that was close to my college campus, and he allowed me to stay there throughout my first college semester. After I got settled, I started carrying out interviews for potential roommates. I probably went over a hundred candidates till I met him. His name was Jason Gunner, and he was perfect. During the interview, I noticed that he was very polite and well-mannered. He also had an amazing aura around him. When I was finally done with the interview, I knew without a doubt that Jason was the perfect person to be my roommate. But there was still a little something that bothered me. So I normally ran a background check on everyone I interviewed as it was one of the most important things to do when looking for a roommate. But when I tried to run a background check on Jason Gunner, the results came back scanty as there was little to no information about him. I asked him about this and he said that he mostly lived a low profile life, which is why there wasn't much of his background on the internet. I knew it was a pretty hasty decision, but I took his word for it and I told myself that maybe having little to no information on you out there was a good thing. So after a while, all the arrangements were settled and it didn't take long before Jason started moving in. Things went perfectly at first, as the first few months were wonderful. I loved living with Jason as he usually made pancakes for both of us in the mornings and he also helped in doing most of the chores around the apartment. During this time, I realized that I made the right decision because Jason was a delight to live with. But all that joy and perfection abruptly stopped. When I brought home, my then boyfriend, Harvey Lance. I had met Harvey on campus two months after I started the semester. He too was one of the sweetest guys I had met and things were going really great between us. 
I remember the first time I introduced them to each other, and I remember seeing Jason with a frown on his face. That was really odd to me, as Jason was usually a happy guy, and I hardly ever saw him frown, but as the evening went on, I could tell that he really did not like Harvey. Now, there was no reason for Jason not to like Harvey, as I was present during all their interactions, and I was sure that nothing rude or out of the ordinary happened. I eventually came to the conclusion that Jason was just a little jealous. But as more time passed, I realized that what I thought was just petty jealousy was actually real hatred. It didn't take long before Harvey noticed that Jason didn't like him and a massive tension began to form between them. Things got really weird from there as Jason started to act really strange. He started to incessantly follow us around on dates and any time we went out. I didn't notice much of this at first, but Harvey did. And when he told me about it, I thought he was just over-exaggerating as I told him that it probably wasn't Jason and he was just seeing things, but he stuck to his story as he adamantly kept saying that he was sure we were being followed by my roommate. When I got home, I confronted Jason with these claims, but he always denied them saying, Harvey is just delusional and he would say anything to get me out of your apartment and your life. Things started to get heated from there, as any time I was at home, Jason incessantly told me to leave Harvey as he was certain that Harvey was nothing but bad news. And the same thing was happening at school, as any time I was out with Harvey, he always told me to kick Jason out of my apartment as he was sure that there was something really wrong with him. I always told Harvey that I couldn't do that as Jason had already signed a year-long lease and when I was home, I always told Jason that I really liked Harvey and that I wasn't going to leave him. I thought that settled things, but everything just escalated from there. Things weren't going really great at home as the nice Jason I once knew was no more. He was now constantly rude to me and he always locked himself in his room every time I was in the apartment. Things weren't also going too great at school either as Harvey was too annoyed that I still hadn't kicked him out. It took a while, but I eventually couldn't take it anymore. I was in my first year of college and these two people were just bringing additional tension into my life. I didn't have the time to deal with it anymore, so I decided to even out the equation by taking them both out of my life. I decided to start with Jason as I planned to pay him back the rent money with interest and tell him to leave as soon as possible. But when I got home, I could hear people shouting through my door. From the hallway, I could hear Jason and Harvey throwing words at each other as I heard Jason say, I tried my best to make sure everything was perfect between us, but you just had to come in and ruin everything. Harvey then replied, I never did anything to you, man, and you are delusional. There was no us. You're just a creepy and obsessive roommate who followed us around on our dates. Can't you get it into your head that you're just roommates and nothing more? That's when I heard Jason scream. She belongs to me and no one else. She just doesn't know it yet, and I'm going to do anything to make sure nothing comes between us, even you. I had heard enough at this point as I walked in and said, That's it, Jason. You're a totally different person now, and to be honest, it's frightening, so I need you to leave. I then watched as Jason calmly said, I'm not going anywhere, my sweet Elizabeth. We're meant to be together, forever. His eyes looked malicious as he said those words, and I started to get scared. Harvey, who was still in the room, then said, What the hell is wrong with you, man? Didn't you just hear what she said? You need to leave now before I make you leave. That's when Jason, who now had a crazed look in his eye, lunged at Harvey. They fought viciously for a while before Harvey managed to knock Jason off his feet. Jason fell to the floor, and Harvey turned to me and said, You need to call the cops now, Elizabeth. This guy is crazy. I started to look for my phone, but before I could find it, Harvey, who noticed this, decided to come help me. But as he started to walk towards me, I watched in horror as Jason, in a fit of rage, angrily pushed Harvey. Harvey tripped and fell head first into a glass center table. The impact was hard as the glass broke and I noticed Harvey wasn't moving anymore. It took me a while before it finally dawned on me, but I knew without a doubt that Harvey was dead. It was an accident as I knew Jason didn't mean to kill him, but he was still the one who pushed him. I managed to find my phone as I called 911, but as I dialed the number, Jason immediately took the phone away from me. 
so I screamed. What are you doing, you psycho? We need to call the cops. Jason, who now had a look of terror in his eyes, said, No, you can't do that. I can't go back to jail again. I could feel the tears running down my cheek as I said, So what do you want us to do, Jason? Harvey's dead. I know you didn't mean to, and it was an accident, but we still have to call the cops. Jason then said, They won't believe me. They never do. He then walked up to me and hugged me in a messed up attempt to comfort me as he calmly whispered in my ear. Besides, even if it was an accident, a part of me had to do this. I am willing to do anything to keep you with me, my sweet Elizabeth. His words sent shivers down my spine as I finally realized that Jason was living in some sick fantasy and that he was truly insane. I then pushed him off me as I backed away. I couldn't recognize him anymore as Jason now looked like a truly different person. After I had pushed him away, Jason then looked at me and said, We have to be together, Elizabeth. I know what we should do. Let's run away. Let's go far away and keep on living together. Jason had a sick grin on his face as he said those words. So I knew I had to protect myself. I tried to run into my bedroom and lock myself in there, but he was faster as he caught up with me. He started pulling me towards the door as I screamed, but that's when we started to hear sirens. Relieved, I realized that my call must have gone through and I was saved. It didn't take long before the cops surrounded the building. I then told Jason to give up and open the door, but he didn't listen as he looked me dead in the eyes and said, If I can't live with you, I don't want to live at all. I then watched in horror as he jumped out the window to his gruesome death. Two deaths happened that day on the campus and I was the only survivor. I told the cops everything that happened and an investigation was carried out. Harvey's parents were heartbroken as they blamed me for it. I didn't complain as I knew Harvey meeting Jason was all my fault. I also met with Jason's father who had heard what happened to his son. He was a nice man who apparently wanted to meet me and apologize. Shocked, I wondered what he wanted to apologize for, and when we met, he told me that Jason had suffered from a peculiar form of OCPD, an obsessive compulsive personality disorder since he was a kid. He said this disorder made him obsess over certain people, especially women as he saw them as things he owned. He then said to me that Jason was a good boy who tried to suppress and fight the thoughts by being a nice person, but they always got the best of him, and it led to numerous incidents of him lashing out. This in turn led him to getting charged with numerous cases of assault and battery. I then asked why those cases didn't come up when I did a background check, and he said Jason was trying to turn a new leaf, so he recently changed his last name from Lance to Gunner, as that was his mother's last name. The revelations were shocking to me, and when the case was finally over, I left college for a while as I decided to take a deferred year or two to get help over the trauma I experienced. I have never and I will never forget what happened to me that day. That experience opened my eyes as I realized firsthand that you can never really know someone, even the ones who live with you.